You know it's this. Take a perk and talk it and see. Money swallowing like six. Did it perfect to the kid. Got a million who's single, my hate and nothing better. Put on the road, I just win. I know we got a million dollars, the devil that's it, and I chip it again. Hello and welcome back, fellow anime lovers, to Manga Muse. I am delighted to have you join us once again in the world of fanfiction and fantasy. This is the third part of What If Deku Finds Ben's Watch Ultimatrix. Special note, this fanfic is written in a masterpiece of the incredible muffin on fanfiction.net. Do check and support the author too. Now smash the like, share and subscribe button for more. Also press the bell icon so that you never miss such great parts. Thanks for the introduction. Now let's dive into the world. The morning after the attack on the USJ, Midoriya had just finished breakfast when his phone alerted him to new messages. He saw that it was from UAS Rising Stars and opened up his messenger app. Glasses, how is everyone this morning? Look, I am a little sore, but that's to be expected. But you, Mina and Izuku had the worst injuries. Are you three okay? Glasses, recovery girl said not to use my boosters for at least three more days, but other than some discomfort, I'm fine. All might, I'm all healed up, actually. Swamp Fire's regeneration is better than Recovery Girl please don't tell her I said that. Crayon, only if you help me W, my math homework. First week of school, and we got Trig. It sucks and makes me want to cry. All might, deal. How are your hands, Mina? Crayon, stiff, and it's hard to move them. But RG says it'll be fine in a few days. Frog, hi, Ribbit. I'm fine, but my legs are sore. I don't normally do big jumps like the one on the boat. Also, you still owe me mouthwash, Izuku. Tape, hey, guys. Wait, what's this about mouthwash? Did you leave out something yesterday? I need to know. Frog, I had to carry mine to in my tongue. Twice. Tape, ah, enough said. On behalf of every male out there, I apologize for him. All Might, Glasses, Comet, Morning, Everyone, Comet, Am I the only one who isn't all sore and junk? Is it weird that I feel bad about that? Book, You have something like Survivor's Guilt, Achako, and you have nothing to feel guilty about. If anything, we are all glad that you aren't hurt. Tape, Besides, you got hurt during the battle training, so it evens out. Also, if you feel guilty, I should feel guilty, since I feel fine too. Crayon, Preach, SR Sly, Achako, Don't let this get you down. You are much prettier when you smile. Comet, love you too, Mina. Midoriya smiled. It was good to see his friends so supportive of each other. Book, I admit, the only problem I had was that I had some trouble sleeping. I had a close call yesterday, and I had some nightmares about all of you in danger. Book, I know you can all take care of yourselves, and we proved that yesterday, but I have a selfish request. Book, would you all be willing to get together sometime today? I realize that this is at the last minute, and I apologize. Crayon, time and place, it'll be there. Tape, Comet, Frog, Ribbit. Tape, I knew you'd do that. Frog, I'm imagining your face right now, and it is hilarious. Glasses, I would be happy to meet up with you all. I admit that I had some anxiety myself last night, but my brother talked me through it. All might, I just need to let my mom know if I'm not going to be home in the evening, but I shouldn't have a problem. She'll probably just be happy that I have friends to spend time with. Ben looked over his shoulder at his phone. That might have been a little too much, dude. It's true, though. Midoriya shrugged. I don't really know what hanging out is like. Comet, OMG, you're breaking my heart, Deku-kun. That's it, now we have to meet up today. Crayon, frog, tape, glasses, book, I'll send you all my home address. Oh, and don't worry about any travel fares, I will reimburse you. Don't even try to fight it. I took debate in middle school, and I will counter every argument. Book, I'll ask mother and father to set aside some rooms for us. There will be tea and food. After a few minutes of discussion, the group decided to meet up a little afternoon, and spend a few hours doing whatever came to mind. There was no real plan, but Yeyorazu suggested something relaxing, like spending time in her family's library. Ashido made a token complaint, but the idea of spending time with friends in a stress-free environment overrode her dislike of academic studies, and she became more interested when Yeyorazu mentioned a large section of romance novels. Midoriya got himself ready for the day and sent a message to his mother, who was more than happy for him, and then looked up the best route to the Yeyorazu home. He only checked for one stop on the way there before ordering his train tickets. Well, Ashida whispered. Yeah, Midoriya said. Ribbit. Siro grinned nervously. I knew she was rich, but... Yeah. The Ayurazu home was huge. Calling it a mansion would have been a disservice. Midoriya could only see the front from his spot in front of the gate, and though it wasn't as tall as his apartment building, 
it probably still exceeded it in pure mass. Midoriya very quickly felt underdressed. He was wearing jeans and a green t-shirt that had t-shirt printed on it, so he looked more than a little out of place. Ida pushed his glasses further onto the bridge of his nose, with his khaki pants and polo shirt. He looked like he was heading to a business meeting not hang out with friends. I think this is her spring residence. Uraraka, who had been gaping silently until now, whirled. She has more than one house. Yes, I remember my brother once worked on a case that involved the Yeyarazu family. They invited him to their winter home, and he joked that they were renovating their summer home. Ciro raised an eyebrow. Does she have a home for every season? Ida shrugged. Possibly, I'm not acquainted with the family, and I only met Yamomo at UA. As ever, Asui was the voice of reason. We're not going to get anywhere just standing here, Ribbit. Let's ring the doorbell. She pressed the button on the side of the gate. Less than a second later, Yeyurazu's voice came out of a speaker. Oh, wonderful. You're all here. One moment, let me open the gate for you. Ben chuckled. You sure you're the only one who didn't have friends? She seems way too happy that you're all here. Midoriya couldn't disagree. He could almost hear Yeyurazu's smile in her voice. The large doors opened just before the group actually got there. Yeyurazu, wearing a pink blouse and white shorts, stood in the doorway and beamed. Welcome to our home, she said, and ushered them all inside. They put their shoes onto beautifully carved wooden shelves, and Yeyurazu took them on an abbreviated tour that ended in an enormous dining hall. Please, make yourselves comfortable while I get the tea. Midoriya sat on an oak chair that, despite its fine craftsmanship, was incredibly comfortable. Okay, so, this is happening. I guess so, Ribbit. Asui said, her only sign of nervousness was how she kept smoothing out her yellow dress and green jacket. I feel like I should be paying to sit down. Uraraka sat limply in her own chair, and then looked down at her modest shorts and red shirt before looking up again. I could fit every relative I have in just this room. It's bigger than my parents' house. Ashido nodded. Aside from Ida, I think all of us live in places smaller than this room. Ida shifted uncomfortably. I'm sorry, I wasn't aware that this would be so. Overwhelming. Is something the matter? Yeyurazu smiled as she pushed a trolley that held a set of teacups that were probably worth more than what Midoriya's mother made in several months. No, nothing at all. Siro tried to look nonchalant, and only partly succeeded. I guess none of us have been in a house this big before. It's really cool. Oh, thank you. Yeyurazu began handing out tea and slices of cake. To be honest, it's wonderful to have company over, usually, it's just the staff and my parents' business partners. Uraraka leaned over to whisper in Midoriya's ear. She has staff. Midoriya nodded weakly. But she acts like she's always alone. Thanks for all of this, Yamomo, yeah, he said, gesturing vaguely to the tea, and then the room in general. The others quickly echoed his sentiment. Yeyurazu blushed. Please, it was the least I could do. If this is the least, what happens when she pulls out all the stops? Uraraka whispered. I'm imagining gold-plated robots serving meals from a five-star restaurant. Midoriya muttered back. It took some time, but everyone eventually got comfortable enough to enjoy the tea a brand called Imperial Golden Tips, which was a favorite of Yeyurazu's and have a casual conversation. None of them were willing to talk about the villain attack yet. Yeyurazu was just too happy to bring that up for now. After the tea and cake, they were brought a light meal which looked like something Midoriya had seen on a high-class cooking show by several maids, whose uniforms were probably more expensive than Midoriya's nicest clothes. Once that was done, Yeyarazu brought them to the library, where huge shelves carried books on every subject Midoriya could imagine. What really caught his attention was an entire section on pro heroes. Wow, Midoriya tentatively reached out and grabbed an older book. This is a biography of Shimura Nana. This hasn't been in print for decades. Yeyurazu nodded eagerly. Oh, yes, my mother is a fan. She even met her once. If I'm being honest, Shimura-san inspired me more than any other female hero. Wait, who's Shimura Nana? Yuraraka asked. Everyone else, even Ida, looked lost. She was the first woman to get into Japan's top 10 heroes. Midoriya exclaimed. A lot of people agree that she was the one who helped women break into the pro-hero business. Really? Uraraka shrugged, which was mirrored by the others. How come I've never heard of her? Yeyurazu and Midoriya shared a sad look. Well, she died in a fight with a villain about 30 years ago, the former said. Heroes dying to villains, especially the more popular ones, isn't something the government likes to cover, so they let her fade into obscurity. I think they pulled all of her merchandise within a few months after her death. They didn't even say who the villain was or if they were caught. At the mention of villains, the group fell into an awkward silence as they sat on beautiful recliners. Arashido glanced around. Are we gonna talk about what happened yesterday? I feel like we should, Ciro said. 
I mean, better to talk about it with you guys than a school shrink, right? For another moment, they were quiet again. I was so scared, Yuraraka said, her voice small. Everything was happening so fast. And then Deku-kun, Su-chan, Yamomo you all disappeared. I mean, I was worried about the rest of the class, but you guys are my friends, and when you were gone, I thought you might be. Yuraraka choked, and her eyes watered. Without even thinking about it, Midoriya reached out and took her hand in his. We weren't, he said firmly. We're all okay, right? Yeah. Ashido held up her hands, which were still bandaged. This was probably the worst injury any of us had, and I'm gonna be fine. Yuraraka nodded and rubbed her eyes with her free hand. Thanks. I think knew that, I just needed to hear it. Anytime, Midoriya said, and then realized he was still holding her hand. Oh oh, I'm s sorry, I d didn't mean to. Now it was Yuraraka's turn to interrupt, though with a giggle. It's fine, Deku-kun. Oh, look, he's back to stuttering. Siro leaned over and playfully smacked Midoriya's shoulder. Fighting villains, talking about quirk theory, gushing about heroes, being all noble, no problem at all. Ashido winked at Midoriya, chilling out with a pretty girl. He turns into a mess. He's gonna make all the boys in class so jealous, ribbit, Asui said with the slightest hint of a smile. Mina and Yamomo think he's adorable. He saved me from the lead villain, and it's obvious that Achako has a crush on him. Ashido just laughed, and Yeyurazu looked away with a bit of color on her cheeks, but Yuraraka's face turned a dangerous shade of red. She tried to cover up her blush with her hands, but accidentally made herself float overhead. Asui pulled her back down with her tongue, and she released her quirk before she made herself sick. You know, I was hoping for a reaction from you, Achako, but I didn't think it would be that good, Ribbit. Asui patted Yuraraka on the shoulder as the girl tried to calm down. Were you hoping for that reaction? Siro grinned as he pointed at Midoriya, who had gone nearly catatonic, mumbling incoherently and blushing hard enough that Ida looked genuinely concerned. That's even better, Ribbit. Once Midoriya and Yuraraka composed themselves, Yeyurazu suggested they all find something they enjoyed reading. She picked out a science textbook which made Ashido grimace while Ida found a history of early pro heroes, something that he promised to trade with Midoriya when he was done reading the Shimura biography. Asui picked out an encyclopedia on frogs, to absolutely no one's surprise, and Yuraraka found an old fantasy novel from the pre-quirk days. Siro was revealed to be a fan of older genres when he came back with a noir detective novel. Ashido took the longest to find a book, and when she did, everyone blushed. The cover involved a woman wearing only a sheet, held in the arms of a near-naked man who looked like he'd been sculpted, not born. At least we all know each other's preferences, Midoriya pointed out, though to the group's amusement, he was still red-faced after seeing Ashido's choice in reading material. For her part, Ashido glanced at the cover of her book and then waggled her eyebrows at the boys. I bet you could be like this hunk if you hit the gym every day, she said. How often do you boys work out? I train at least three times a week, Ida said, flustered. Siro shrugged, unfazed by Ashido's saucy grin. I go to a gym sometimes, but mostly for the rock climbing. At this point, steam was dangerously close to coming out of Midoriya's ears. I started a W workout R regimen almost a year ago. Well, keep at it, and you might at least look as ripped as Kirishima. Ashido grinned even wider and turned to the other girls. Hum, did you see the abs on that boy? You could grate cheese on that. Yeyorazu gently nudged her. All right, please stop, you too, Tsuyu. Fine, but just for today, Ashido said. I'll give you until next week, Ribbit. For a while, they settled into a comfortable silence, only broken by the occasional giggle from Ashido as she read. At one point, though, Yuraraka let out a gusty sigh that got their attention. Does anyone ever wonder if heroes in the early days acted like this? She held up her book. People who just did the right thing for its own sake, not because it got them attention, or because it was their job. Technically, that's being a vigilante, Yeyurazu pointed out. Many of them are people who couldn't get a license for hero work, but still want to help. Many of their intentions are noble, but it's still illegal to use your quirk outside of special circumstances. Still, most of them are left alone if they're just picking up trash or helping people cross the street. Some heroes actually don't mind if they're around in a crisis, because they help evacuate civilians. It's just the ones that try to fight villains and cause trouble that are the problem. Speaking of being heroes, Midoriya said, his tone innocently curious. Can I ask you all a question? Sure, Deku-kun, Yuraraka said. Why do you want to be heroes? Midoriya shrugged. I mean, it's kind of obvious that I was inspired by All Might, but what about the rest of you? Ida smiled proudly. Well, I come from a long line of heroes. I see it as a responsibility and a great honor to uphold that tradition. Yeyurazu looked a little embarrassed. I've been blessed with a good life and a good quirk. 
I felt that I should do all I can to give back to the world as a hero. Ribbit, I really like helping people, Asui said. And I'm pretty good at making my siblings happy, so I thought I could make other people happy too. Yuraka was quiet for a moment. If I answer, can you all promise you won't make fun of me? Everyone unanimously promised. Well for the money, Midoriya glanced at her. Really? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Being a pro hero is still a job, but... No, it's not that. Yuraka looked down at her lap. My parents, they have a construction company, but business hasn't been very good for a while. They don't have a lot of money, so I thought I could be a pro hero and make their lives easier. They kept telling me that I didn't have to do it for them, but they worked so hard to get me into UA, so when I make it big, I'm gonna send them on an all-expense paid vacation to Hawaii. By the time she was done, everyone had stopped to stare at her. What? That is incredibly noble. Ida started chopping the air in excitement. You're sacrificing some of your own future to help your family. Truly, you are a selfless person. Yeah, now I feel kinda bad, Ashido said. I wanted to be a hero because of all the cool stuff I could do, but I never really thought about how I would help people. I think you just inspired me, Achako. I feel the same as Mina, Siro said. Being a hero always sounded cool, but helping people I know never really crossed my mind. I always pictured myself helping random citizens, but actually having a connection to people I've helped I've got some stuff to think about now. Ribbit, that's really sweet of you. Asui hopped over and smiled. You're doing a good thing. Yeyurazu just nodded, but when no one was looking, she made a note on her phone to talk to her parents about possibly hiring Yuraraka's family for any construction projects in the future. Midoriya, deliberately this time, reached out and put his hand over hers. That is now my favorite reason why anyone became a hero. Yuraraka beamed. Thanks, Deku-kun. Ashido watched the two of them gaze into each other's eyes and smirked. She lightly elbowed Yeyurazu, pointed with her chin in their direction and waggled her eyebrows. For her part, Yeyurazu just rolled her eyes, though she did think it was very sweet. The sun had set, and Yeyurazu insisted that they all stay for dinner. Like before, the meal was incredibly expensive, but it tasted amazing, and nobody complained. Afterwards, they began getting ready to leave. We should do this again, Yeyurazu said as her friends put on their shoes. At the very least, we can have a good place to study for tests. A wonderful idea, Yeyamomo. Ida nodded decisively. We should organize study groups on weekends. The weekends before tests, Ashido amended. We all need time to relax, too, or we'll burn ourselves out. But I'm totally down for hangouts with you guys. The rest of the group quickly agreed they were about to head out. But then Midoriya realized that he still had one thing left to do. Hey, Tsuyu. Midoriya pulled the small bottle of mouthwash he'd bought from a convenience store between train stops from his pocket and tossed it to her. I th think we're even now. For a moment, it almost looked like Asui would actually laugh. Instead, she just smiled. Thanks, Ribbit. See you guys after the weekend. Ashido called out, waving back at Yeyurazu. Aside from the whole thing with the villains, this has been a great week. Totally. Siro shared a high five with her, taking care not to hit too hard because of her hands. I'm actually excited for school. How weird is that? They shared a laugh, but when it came time for them all to split up, Yuraka lingered with Midoriya. Hey, Deku-kun. What's up, Achako? Midoriya blushed. Wait, we're not with everyone else. Sorry for calling you by your first name. It's fine, Yuraka said with a bright smile. I just wanted to ask you something. Oh, gee, go ahead. How are you doing? She asked. You were so concerned about all of us, especially yesterday. But you haven't said anything about yourself. Midoriya took a deep breath. W well, I can't say I wasn't scared. But everything happened so fast, so I didn't really have time to think about it until the end, I mean. Shigaraki was really close to grabbing me, and I ran out of time. He shuddered for a moment, but forced a smile back on his face. Me but All Might showed up, and I'm fine now. Yuraka didn't look like she completely believed him, which was fair, he didn't completely believe himself. Still, she didn't call him out on it, since he'd at least admitted that he'd been scared. Instead, she hesitantly walked up and hugged him. Midoriya froze, he was getting used to talking to girls, but now there was a girl hugging him. Unlike yesterday, he was completely aware of what was happening a pretty girl was hugging him, and he had no idea what to do. Then, who had been absent for almost the entire visit, was no help at all. He just appeared, grinned, and disappeared again. I'm glad you're okay, Deku-kun, Yuraka said quietly, and then stepped back and smiled. See you at school. Aha, uh -huh, Midoriya managed. Once she was gone, Ben appeared again. Man, you have had an interesting week. I hope the rest of the year isn't this eventful, 
or you're going to need anxiety meds. Midoriya couldn't help but agree. Unlike almost all of the other UA students, Midoriya didn't spend the entire weekend out of school. Though class had been cancelled until next week, Nezu had sent him an email saying that the offer of extra training was still open on Saturday. He wasn't required to come for this one, but the tone of the email suggested he wanted Midoriya to go, which was why he showed up at school in the early hours of the morning. He was unsure of how to dress, so he came in his uniform. Waiting for him just past the front gate was Nezu, sipping what looked like coffee from a thermos. Good morning, Midoriya-san. The little creature smiled widely. I trust that you rested well yesterday. Why yes, Nezu-sensei. Midoriya bowed respectfully. I was spending time with some of my classmates. I trust none of you were doing anything strenuous. Nezu didn't seem serious and was just making idle conversation. Yesterday was meant for you all to recuperate. We just talked, had some food, and read in Yeyorazu-san's library. Midoriya smiled at the memory. It was the first time I've ever spent a day with friends like that. Nezu's own smile turned a bit strained. Yes, I imagine living quirkless for so long prevented you from having many friends. He shook his head. When quirks first emerged, many of those who had powers were shunned by society. Now, it is those without quirks who are treated as if they are unnatural. I it wasn't so bad. Midoriya protested, though Ben rolled his eyes. Stop that, Ben. While I can't see him right now, I assume that Ben has done something to refute that statement. Nezu shrugged. But enough of such dreary topics today. We have a few more minutes of walking, so please, tell me what you read at Yeyorazu-san's home. When Midoriya talked about the Shimura biography, Nezu laughed. He told Midoriya that he himself had read that same book and had met Shimura Nana years ago. To Midoriya's disappointment, the good part of the biography was guesswork, as Shimura had kept a great deal of her personal life a secret. He did hint that he knew some of those secrets, but they were not his to tell, which Midoriya could respect. After all, Nezu was keeping his secrets. Ah, here we are, the principal said. Jim Alpha, there is equipment here that can be useful for almost any quirk, as well as modular terrain for different techniques, and rings for full contact sparring. What am I starting on first? Midoriya asked, excited to train somewhere that wasn't a field of garbage. It's less of a what and more of a who. Nezu giggled to himself as he stepped inside. Though, in this case, you'll recognize them. Hey, freshman. Midoriya jumped a foot into the air at the familiar voice. And here I thought it would be a while before we saw each other again. Standing there in their gym uniforms was the big three. Tagata was doing some stretches, Hata was casually flying overhead, and Amajiki was lifting several weights with the massive tentacles that now replaced his fingers. Hey, hey. Hato darted back to the ground and landed in front of Midoriya. It's great to see you again. How are your friends, the one with glasses, and the pink one that hit on Mirio and Tamaki? Tagata laughed at the reminder while Amajiki groaned. It took Midoriya a moment to adjust to Hato's enthusiasm. She was also a pretty girl that had gotten well within his personal space. W well, Ida is D doing a lot B better, and Ashido SH should be able to T take off her B bandages in another day or two. He looked down at Nezu. You didn't say the big three would be here. Nezu grinned up at him. To be fair, I didn't tell them that you would be here, either. He started walking towards a flight of stairs. You four get started on your training. Midoriya-san, remember that I want you to focus on just one transformation for today. Tagata-san, Hato-san, Amajiki-san I would appreciate it if you didn't kill him. Why yes, Nezu-sensei. It took Midoriya a second to register what Nezu had said to the big three. Wait, what? Tagata slapped him on the back hard enough to send him stumbling forward, directly into Hato, who immediately hugged him. Oh, he's so cute, Mirio. She gave the older boys pleading eyes. Can we keep him? Please. Only if you let him go, Nejire, Tagata said with a laugh. I'm pretty sure he stopped breathing. That's even worse than the first time you hugged Tamaki. Hato pouted, but let Midoriya go. Um, I'm, uh, gonna go get into my gym clothes. Be right back. Hato laughed, Tagata grinned, and even Amajiki smirked for a second. Poor kid, he's been here for two minutes, and those two have already decided to take him under their wing. I might as well make sure they don't accidentally kill him with embarrassment. Nezu entered the observation room to find three familiar faces. Ah, you're all here. I was wondering if I would have to resort to drastic measures. A tall, lanky man in a white suit adjusted his glasses. That wouldn't have been necessary, Nezu-san. I was prepared for this meeting. A short, old man in a white costume with yellow boots, gloves, cape and belt rolled his eyes behind his double diamond mask. If you say you saw this coming with your quirk, I'm gonna hit you, Night Eye. Sir Night Eye, former sidekick to All Might, smirked. Nothing so dramatic. It was fairly obvious that Nezu-san wanted us to meet when he invited me to observe Mirio's extra training. 
is customary, Frown returned as he turned to the final member of the group. What I don't know is why you aren't down there training him. All Might, he's your successor. All Might looked rather silly at the moment. In his skinny form, he was practically swimming in his costume. He also looked distinctly uncomfortable being in the presence of his employer, his old teacher, and his former sidekick. After his fateful battle years ago, he had parted with the latter two on less than the best of terms, and conversations over the last few months had been awkward at best. Choosing Tagata as his successor had helped mend that fence, but it was slow going. Well, I actually have a good reason for that. Gran Torino jabbed his cane at the man's chest. You better not have pushed your time limit again, Toshinori. No, no, in fact, I'm taking a break today. He held up his hands at the incredulous looks he was getting. It's true, I only used my muscle form to get here quickly, because I slept in a bit. Anyway, the reason I'm not down there is because young Mirio has already developed his fighting style. He's now incorporating the extra power and learning to regulate it safely, if anything. I'm just here to make sure he doesn't overdo it. And yes, I know that's being a little hypocritical. Gran Torino glanced at Sir Night Eye. Should we be concerned that he's being all responsible for once? Sir Night Eye shrugged. I can't discount the possibility that choosing a successor has opened his eyes, so to speak. He turned his attention to the fourth student to arrive. What perplexes me is why you have brought that first-year student, Nezu-san. Is this the one with multiple quirks? Nezu nodded. Yes, I brought him here because he has potential the likes of which I've never seen. However, he only learned how to use his quirk recently, and in terms of practical application, he is woefully behind the rest of his class. Thankfully, he is a quick study. My aim is to have him train with the best students in UA, their experience will help him, and the sheer variety of his transformations will hone them in turn. All Might laughed, and then spat out blood. I think Aizawa would call that a very rational decision. Sir Night I just raised an eyebrow. I wonder Mirio is already set to be the next symbol of peace. Will someone like this Midoriya help him, or hinder him? I suppose we'll find out, Nezu said. All right, let's start with some sparring, Tagata said, and pointed to the ring. You and me, freshman, show me what you've got. Midoriya nodded. Okay. He cycled through his aliens and then made his choice for the day. Humongousaur. Ooh, I remember that one from the other day. Hado hovered a few feet in the air and quickly circled around him. This form is pretty tough. You took a blast from my quirk and shook it off. Sorry about that, by the way. Humongousaur shrugged. It wasn't that big a deal. I'm just glad it was me and not someone else. Aw, that's so sweet. She turned in midair and gave Tagata a stern look. We just got him, so no breaking him. Tagata laughed. I'll do my best. The two students went to opposite sides of the ring. Tagata cracked his knuckles, but to the surprise of the big three, human Gausser started to grow in size until he was almost 40 feet tall. Large plates sprouted from his back, and wicked spikes emerged from the end of his tail. Oh, so this form actually has a surprise, Tagata noted. Does Mount Lady know you're copying her? Human Gausser scratched his cheek. Well, in her defense, she can reach just over 67 feet tall, and my maximum is about 60. That's some spot-on trivia. Tagata grinned. Also in her defense, you aren't as pretty. Human Gausser couldn't help but chuckle. You're not wrong. He took a deep breath. All right, let's do this. Hado reached up and fired a tiny spiral of energy. Okay, go. Human Gausser charged, covering the distance between them in three massive footsteps. He swung his fist in a downward arc that was aimed at Tagata's chest. However, an instant before he made contact, Tagata's clothes melted off his body, and Human Gausser's fist passed harmlessly through him. Wait, what? Human Gausser watched as Tagata then sank into the floor. I thought he had enhanced strength. Tagata then popped straight up, completely naked and crackling with golden energy again. He caught the surprised Human Gausser on the chin and sent him tumbling back. Power! Tagata roared as he landed on his feet. Come on, Midoriya, that can't be all you've got. What happened to that kid who beat Namu? Human Gausser rubbed his sore jaw. Okay, fine, let's try again. No matter how many times he attacked, or from what angle, he was unable to land a hit on Tagata. His blows just passed through, and then Tagata would counter with a punch or kick that left Human Gausser more like a dinosaur-sized punching bag. He considered using one of his other aliens, but Nezu had told him to only use one for the day. Even if he could, he wasn't sure if he had anything in his arsenal that could hit Tagata. Finally, after an hour of being beaten into the ground, the Ultimatrix timed out, and Midoriya was left a panting, bruised mess on the floor. Hado knelt by his side and gave him a bottle of water. Amajiki gave another to Tagata, after the boy put his pants back on. A valiant effort, Midoriya-san, Nezu said as he walked back into the room. 
There are many pros who couldn't last that long against Tagata-san, and you only transform back because you reached your limit. Sometimes, the best you can ever hope for is to keep your opponent busy while other heroes evacuate the area. Can I? Midoriya took a long drink of water and then tried again. Can I use another transformation to heal up? Of course, but you can only use that one for that purpose unless you train using it next week. Nezu turned around. I'll be back in the observation room if anyone needs me. Please continue whenever you're ready. Midoriya nodded in thanks, but froze again when Hado started stroking his hair. H. Hado-san, W. What are you D doing? Sorry, I couldn't resist. Hado giggled, but didn't stop. You're just so adorable, and you never gave up, even when it was impossible to hit Mirio. Speaking of which, she turned a devastating pout to Gata's way. I told you not to be so hard on him. Tagata took a step back. He has a transformation that heals him, and I didn't go all out. Midoriya glanced down at the Ultimatrix. The dial was still red. While I wait, can I ask you three a question? Sure, go ahead, Tagata said. Can I ask you about your quirks? Midoriya was particularly interested in Tagata's, but he wanted to know about all of them. Who? Me first. Hado sprang up and generated a small spiral in her hand. My quirk is called Wave Motion. I turn my own stamina into spiral shockwaves. I can exhaust myself if I overdo it, but I've always got lots of energy. Oh, and I can use it to fly, which is so much fun. Hey, do you have a transformation that lets you fly? Midoriya Kun. We can be flying buddies. I, oh, I do have a few forms that can fly, Midoriya said as he limped towards a bench. As soon as he sat down, Hado resumed messing with his hair. Your turn, Tamaki, she said, pointing at the boy in question. Amajiki slouched tiredly. My quirk is called Manifest. I can gain the physical properties of anything I eat. He held up one hand, which morphed into a giant crab claw. I like to eat seafood as much as possible. Midoriya's eyes went wide, even the one that was starting to darken from Tagata's last punch as he pulled out his notebook. That's incredible. Does it work for non-animal food as well? How long does it last? Is there a limit to what you can do? Amajiki flinched at the enthusiastic questions. It's not as impressive as your quirk, but I can utilize non-animal characteristics. I once used a plant's ability to photosynthesize during an internship and I was really tired and I can use it until I digest it. Other than that, I don't really have a limit, though it can get exhausting when I force my body to go through so many changes. Midoriya had gone starry-eyed at that point. It made Amajiki uncomfortable, but Hado and Tagata found it adorable. Your turn, Mirio, Amajiki muttered. Don't make me do that again. Tagata just laughed. Fair enough. Okay, freshman, my quirk is called permeation. I can turn my body intangible and pass through anything. But it requires a lot of steps, because if I don't get it right, I'll just sink into the floor, or I might make part of my body intangible. But the rest of me will just smack into the wall I'm trying to go through. Sinking into the floor worked well during our spar, Midoriya pointed out. Yeah, but when I do that, I can't see, hear, or breathe, since all the air passes through me, Tagata said. His smile didn't waver, but his tone was more serious. And gravity gets weird when I do that, so I'll keep falling until I turn my quirk off. Thankfully, as soon as I do, it spits me up and out of the ground, since matter can't occupy the same spot. Also, without my costume, I always become naked when I fully utilize my quirk. Midoriya frowned. What about the strength and speed? I'm interested to hear how he explains that. All Might said as they listened in. We never gave him a cover story. He's also not a good liar, Sir Knight I commented. To be frank, none of them are. Tagata chuckled and scratched the back of his head. Well, it turns out that I've only been utilizing half of my quirk. When I pass through an object, I'm absorbing kinetic energy, something involving physics that I don't understand. Since I didn't know how to release that energy, I've just been storing it up for most of my life. I only figured out how to tap into that power a few months ago, but since I have such a big store of it now, I'm still learning how to regulate it safely. Amajiki scowled. You might have heard us the other day, but the first time he used this energy, he broke his arm. Yeah, it was scary, Hado said, and hugged Midoriya like he was a stuffed animal that comforted her after a nightmare. The bones were sticking out and everything. It was gross. Tagata nodded. Yeah, it took a while to figure out how to properly use it. And even then, I can only safely use about 15% of my maximum. I can push it to about 20, but I'll be sore all over for a few days. Anything more than that is asking for a visit to Recovery Girl. A small part of Midoriya was glad that he'd brought his notebook. The rest of him was distracted, because Hado was still hugging him. Thankfully, he was saved when the Ultimatrix finished recharging. Um, you're going to want to take a step back, he advised much to his relief. Hado let go. 
This one smells bad. Sure enough, when Midoriya turned into swamp fire, the big three all held their noses and backed off. Still, they watched with fascination as all the bruises faded away, and Tagata grinned when Midoriya turned back to normal. So, you can turn into a walking stink bomb that can regenerate. That's awesome. Midoriya went red-faced again. I can also use seeds that trap people in vines, and I can throw fireballs. Amajiki leaned back, as if he learned that Midoriya was a dangerous weapon. How many transformations do you have? Right now, Midoriya shrugged. 50. All Might was treated to the rare sight of Sir Nighteye looking completely floored when they heard Midoriya's words. Granted, he was also surprised, but he'd suspected that the boy had plenty of transformations they'd yet to see. He has at least 50 quirks. Nighteye leaned against a nearby desk to support himself. The only person I can think of who might have that many powers is. Young Midoriya has no connection to all for one. All Might said firmly. Nezu investigated him, and I trust Nezu's word. Thank you for the vote of confidence, All Might. Nezu hopped onto the desk so that he could more easily meet Night Eye's gaze. The boy has been able to transform for less than a year. If he was truly connected to All for One, I'm certain that Midoriya would be much more dangerous. He's right, Gran Torino said. All for One would never have let someone with such a powerful quirk walk around while he was alive, and if the boy had been working with him, He'd be a lot more experienced than he is. It just doesn't add up. Night I took a long, steadying breath. Very well, I accept your reasoning. But I feel uneasy about someone so unsure of himself possessing such power. I mean no offense. But I will be keeping an eye on him if he is going to be spending time with Muriel. Overprotective, isn't he? Gran Torino stage whispered, and All Might chuckled, only to become serious again. Speaking of him, he said darkly, Tsukachi contacted me about one of the villains from the attack. He's called Namu, and he had multiple quirks. Unlike young Midoriya, this appears to have been done artificially. Night I grimaced. You think he's back? That he's alive? All Might's hands tightened into fists, and he switched to his muscle form on reflex. I hate to even consider it, but I think he just might be. Then Mirio has to be ready. Night I glanced at the screen again, where Midoriya was chatting with the big three. They'll all have to be ready. Midoriya didn't just spar with Sagata. He traded off between Hado and Amajiki as well. Hado was able to bombard Human Gausor with her quirk, and evaded almost all of his strikes. The only exception was when Human Gausor had guessed where she was going, and managed to swat her out of the air with his tail. Technically, because he had knocked her out of the ring, he had won, but all she had was a bad bruise on her side, while he was covered in scrapes, bumps, and burns. It was when he fought Amajiki that things were more even. Both of them were suited for close quarters fighting and Human Gausor could smash aside the giant clamshells that Amajiki used as shields. He had more trouble dealing with the boy's tentacles, because the thick muscle absorbed the shock of his blows. Amajiki almost won by choking him into unconsciousness, but Human Gausor again managed to push him out of the ring. Still, everyone admitted that if it had been a real fight, Human Gausor would have lost all three rounds. I think I need to use Human Gausor against slower, weaker opponents, Midoriya said, after he'd finished recovering. He's probably better at clearing out areas of thugs when fighting. Anyone with mobility and a decent understanding of their own quirk is going to cause me problems. Actually, I might have better luck with rescue work. Tagata looked at him curiously. Oh, what are you thinking? Well, human Gausor is strong, which means lifting up debris will be easy. Oh, and if I need to carry people to safety, all I have to do is grow really big and have people hold onto my back plates while I carry others. Not a bad idea, Amajiki said from the wall, against which he pressed his forehead. You should remember to have the stronger adults hold onto your back while you carry the weaker civilians. Ooh, good call, Hado commented, and then tilted her head. Hey, Midoriya-kun. Why yes, Hado-san. First of all, if you don't start calling me Nejire by next week, I'm gonna make Amajiki cover you in slime with his tentacles. Please don't make me do that again. I'm pretty sure that one guy is still in therapy. Anyway, Hado pointed at the Ultimatrix. How come you sometimes refer to your forms like they're other people? Thankfully, this was something that Midoriya had an easy answer for. Well, some of my transformations make me feel like a different person. It's still me, but at the same time, it isn't. Also, um, when Midoriya hesitated, Tagata slung an arm around his shoulders. Hey, if you don't want to talk about it, it's fine. No, no, I just Midoriya sighed. I actually thought I was quirkless for most of my life. Even now, it sometimes feels like none of this is real, so I have a hard time seeing my different forms as me. Tagata nodded in understanding. I'm gonna give you some advice that I got recently. No matter how weird your quirk is, just remember that it's part of you. Once you accept that, the rest will just fall into place. Th thanks, Mirio-san. 
anytime, freshman. Tagata looked at his phone. Well, I've gotta get home. I've got homework to do. And let me tell you, Midoriya, third year classes are harder than anything you can imagine. Midoriya tried to smile. Something to look forward to, I guess. Tagata and Hado laughed. And though he'd deny it until his dying day, Amajiki's shoulders twitched in a way that suggested laughter. Tagata held out a fist. Same time next week. Midoriya hesitantly brought up his own arm to complete the fist bump. Sure. And so, Midoriya headed home with three new contacts in his phone. Class 1 was still a little subdued as they entered the classroom. For many, a small part of their experience at school would be forever tainted by what happened at the USJ. However, for Midoriya and his friends, things were a little easier. They had talked it over, both in person and over the phone, and while they were far from completely recovered, they walked into school with their heads held high. Do you think we'll get a substitute for homeroom? Siro asked as he and the rest of his friends sat down. Probably, Ribbit. Other than a slight shift of her eyebrows, Asui's expression hardly changed. Aizawa-sensei was in bad shape when Mainta and I got him out of there. The doors slid open, and a familiar, if bandaged, figure walked in. Everyone, take your seats. I'm too tired to deal with your nonsense. Everyone was too surprised to see Aizawa to do more than numbly sit down. The man had bandages on both arms. While his right was in a sling, only his face was exposed, which allowed an unobstructed view of his expression. The poor man looked even more tired than they had ever seen. Aizawa-sensei, Asui croaked, It's good to see you, but are you sure you should be up, Ribbit? Aizawa shrugged as he sat behind his desk. The old lady just wants me to take it easy. It's not like I'm going on patrol until I'm fully recovered. He paused, as if realizing something. There's a lesson for you heroes need to be at the top of their game, and they can't do that if they're hurt. If you're recovering from anything but the most minor of injuries, don't go out in the field again until a doctor says you can. Yes, Aizawa-sensei, the class said dutifully. Anyway, I have an important announcement. Aizawa stretched out his neck before continuing. The UA Sports Festival is coming up soon, and you all will want to be ready. The students immediately began chatting amongst themselves excitedly. The sports festival was one of the biggest events of the year, with the entire country watching. Pro heroes often used it as a way to scout for new talent. Many a successful hero got their start as a sidekick because they made a good showing at the sports festival. As you all know, you'll all have exactly three chances at doing well in the sports festival during your time at UA. Aizawa continued, after a withering glare made the students quiet down. However, the sooner you do well, the better your futures will be, so I suggest you start strong. Until the sports festival begins, every other day will include physical training, quirk training, tactics, and so on. This is on top of your regular classes, so look at this as a good indicator of how well you're doing as a student. If you can't handle schoolwork and increase training, you might want to reconsider being heroes. He coughed into his less injured hand. Also, you're encouraged to train out of class, provided it's of the non-quirk variety. Study groups will help with that. Midoriya and his friends shared a conspiratorial smile. In that regard, they were ahead of the game. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Aizawa promptly leaned back in his chair and closed his eyes. If you've got homework you haven't finished, do it now, you've got the rest of this class. As Midoriya and his friends shifted their desks to move closer, Ashido brought out her half-finished math homework. Midori, you said you'd help me with this, she whined. You want me to be in the sports festival, right? Midoriya rolled his eyes, especially when he saw the answers Ashido had already written down. I expect you to be in the final event, actually. Yeyamomo, can you help me help her? Yeyurazu gave them both a brilliant smile. Of course, they all ended up helping each other except for Yeyurazu, who had finished all of her work early, and helped answer any questions the others had. Between her, Midoriya and Ida, everyone had their homework done and double-checked with time to spare. What do you think this year's sports festival will be like, Ribbit? Asui tapped her chin as she thought about it. Do you think the structure will be the same? I don't see why it wouldn't, Midoriya said. It hasn't changed in years of free-for-all, a team event, and then the bracketed fights. The only thing that changes is the specific events for the first two. That's not much to train for, Yuraraka said nervously. The only thing we can be sure about is combat at the end. That must be why they will be training us so thoroughly, Ida said with a nod. How responsible of such a fine institution to give us the best chance possible. Midoriya nodded, but then jumped when someone coughed behind him. He looked over his shoulder to see Aizawa staring at him. Ah, oh, Aizawa-sensei, is something wrong? No, I just forgot to tell you something, Midoriya. Aizawa actually looked like he regretted what he was about to say. Since you got the top score at the entrance exam, 
That makes you the freshman representative. You'll have to give a short speech before the sports festival officially starts. Midoriya didn't even notice that Aizawa left. He was consumed by sudden and overwhelming panic at the thought of speaking in front of thousands of people in a stadium, and then millions of others who would be watching on television and the walls were closing in please help. Deku-kun, Midoriya snapped out of it when Uraraka started shaking him. Deku-kun, can you hear me? You were trembling and sweating, and you looked like you were about to run for your life. Midoriya took several deep breaths. He was still shaking when Yayarazu gently turned him to face her. Midoriya, were you having a panic attack? She asked. I, a Midoriya lowered his eyes to his desk in shame and nodded. I've never had to speak in front of so many people before. When I thought about it, Yayarazu nodded. I understand. If I may offer a suggestion. Before she could continue, there was a commotion from outside the door. Beck Hugo scowled at the noise, stomped over and slammed the door open. What the hell do you extras want? Here to grovel at the feet of the hero course. There was a small crowd outside the classroom. Midoriya vaguely recognized some of the faces, but didn't know any of the names. He was reasonably sure that none of them were from Class 1B, the other first-year hero course. Well, that sure doesn't leave a good impression. One boy at the front, with wild, purple hair and tired eyes, smirked. Are all hero course students so arrogant, or is it just you? Bakugo snarled, but Kirishima dragged him back. Sorry about that. Man, seriously, I'm pretty sure it's just him. Anyway, uff, what's going on? The boy crossed his arms. The words out that this class fought real villains last week, and we all wanted to get a look at our biggest competition for the sports festival. Ashido leaned over to Midoriya. What's he talking about? It took him a moment to figure it out. Oh, students from non-hero courses who do well enough in the sports festival can earn a reevaluation and possible admittance into the hero course. It's not uncommon. People whose quirks aren't suited for certain scenarios can get passed over at the entrance exams, but then go on to be successful heroes after the sports festival. Bakugo heard all of that and sneered at the crowd. So that's it, huh? You losers couldn't hack it the first time, so you think you can do better after we've actually practiced. Don't make me laugh. The purple-haired boy never lost his composure. Just watch your backs. If you're not careful, your seats in the hero course could get taken by any one of us. Just as he was leaving, he looked over his shoulder. Consider that a declaration of war. Ciro buried his head in his hands. So this competition isn't just going to pit us against each other. We've got targets on our backs that the whole school will be gunning for. Great. As much as it pains me to admit, Bakugo actually raised a good point, Yeyorazu said. As hero course students, we have access to resources that allow us greater training. If we utilize those resources properly, we will have a significant advantage during the festival. But we mustn't get complacent. The students from other courses who want to get into our class will be working harder than any of us can imagine. You heard the class president. Eater rose to his feet and pumped his fist. Let us show you a and the entire world exactly why we deserve to be here and go beyond. Plus Ultra, the more enthusiastic students which included everyone except Bakugo, Todoroki, and Takoyami all mirrored him. Plus Ultra, the first part of Class 1A's accelerated training started with hand-to-hand -hand combat. All Might himself supervised, giving pointers to various students, especially those who had no formal training before UA. Keep moving, young Midoriya. All Might barked as the student was knocked onto his back by Ajiro. If you remain in one place, all you're doing is giving your opponent time to get a good angle on you. Yes, All Might Sensei, Midoriya grunted, and accepted Ajiro's helping hand. Like the other students, they were wearing their gym clothes, and had been sparring in the familiar to Midoriya, anyway Gym Alpha. Would you like some more advice, Midoriya-san? Ajiro asked politely. He had been Midoriya's opponent for the last few minutes, and had been wiping the floor with him. The point of the training was to increase every aspect of their abilities in this case, that meant no quirks, which was why Midoriya was getting beaten like an old rug, even with Ajiro not using his tail. I'll take anything at this point, Midoriya said as he rubbed his sore leg. I've noticed that you don't take the initiative. Ajiro stretched out his arms as he talked. If you can't get out of that mindset, maybe you should focus on counters using your opponent's weight and momentum against them. Taking advantage of openings at the right time, that kind of thing. I don't mean to brag, but I've studied many martial arts and I can help you. He glanced off to the side. So would Yamomo, I'll bet. Midoriya followed his gaze to the neighboring ring and saw Yeyarazu literally throw Sato over her shoulder when he charged at her. At first, he had trouble believing that she'd done that. Wait, no, she must have calculated his trajectory and estimated his weight, thus figuring out the best angle to throw him. If she did the math right, Sato-san would have done most of the work for her. 
Um, Midoriya-san. Midoriya looked up and saw Ajiro's concerned frown. Sorry, but you are mumbling there. Midoriya blushed. Ub, sorry. It's a habit of mine. But, yes, I'll take any help your Yamomo can offer. Across the room, Yuriraka was having as much trouble with her own sparring partner. Kirishima was friendly, true, but he was strong, and Yuriraka wasn't exactly a good fighter. Come on, Yuriraka, hit me like you mean it. Kirishima gave her a sharp-toothed grin. If you don't put your all into a hit, your opponent is going to shrug it off, and then you'll be in trouble like now. Yuriraka yelped when Kirishima lifted her up as easily as if she'd used her quirk on herself, and slammed her onto the mat. The air left her lungs, and she lay there, stunned. Oh, crap, are you okay? Kirishima's face filled her vision, his smile gone. Sorry, I didn't mean to hit you that hard. It's Yuriraka took a deep breath and sat up. It's okay, Kirishima-san. Like you said, I didn't put anything into hitting you, so that's what I get, right? Kirishima grinned sheepishly as he helped her to her feet. Yeah, I guess I knew what I was talking about, huh? Can you, uh, show me how to really throw a punch? Yuriraka rubbed the back of her head in embarrassment. But Kirishima's grin became wider and more genuine. Sure thing. Asking for help to improve is manly as hell, Yuriraka san I'll show you how to knock a villain right on his ass. The entire class was throwing itself into its training. Even Bakugo was less verbally abrasive with his sparring partners, only shouting at them when they made obvious mistakes. It was constructive, in its own way, though he did reduce poor Kota to tears at one point. When All Might told them all that he was proud of the progress they were making, they went home feeling vindicated not just in their efforts, but in the decisions to be heroes at all. The next heroics class wasn't training for the sports festival, but a do-over of their first rescue training. It was with some trepidation that Class 1 returned to the USJ. 13 was there to greet them again, but instead of the big three, all might join them. Having him there did wonders for the students, after all, if villains showed up again, the world's greatest hero would be there from the get-go. Now, you're all going to be divided into groups of four, 13 said. All Might and I will be watching from the observation room to provide instructions or answer questions. Just use the communicators we provided you with outside. All Might took over. One thing you should know is that you'll be rescuing robots that will simulate real people in certain conditions panic, injury, and so on. Since this is your first time doing this, this lesson is more to gauge how you react and what you do. Further lessons will provide details on first aid, on the spot trauma counseling, that sort of thing. Good luck to you all. Midoriya was grouped with Takoyami, Siro, and Asui. He shared a smile with his two friends and shared a respectful nod with Takoyami. He then pulled up his hood. His costume had been repaired by now and was directed towards the landslide zone. See, this is what I was hoping for, Siro said with his usual grin. Actually helping people who need it. I mean, yeah, fighting villains can be part of the job, but I'd rather deal with something that doesn't involve hurting someone. Ribbit, I feel the same way, Asui said as she stretched by hopping instead of walking. I can't say the same, Takoyami's quirk, Dark Shadow, said as he emerged from his partner's chest. I love a good fight. As heroes, we must sometimes work outside what we are comfortable with, Takoyami said sagely. However, the idea of protecting the innocent from the darkness is appealing. Midoriya shrugged. I kind of agree with you, Takoyami-san. There are different ways to protect people either saving their lives from disasters or from villains. Either way, it's our job to make sure that everyone is safe. When they arrived at their test zone, they found a pile of boulders and a humanoid robot half buried under them. This is your first test, 13 said into their earpieces. This civilian is trapped. You must free them, apply first aid, and then transport them to the evacuation area. Midoriya looked around until he saw a gate with a sign saying evacuation not too far off. Well, I guess we should get started. We need to get those rocks off the robot. We should probably treat it like a real person, Ribbit, Asui said. Or else we might not try as hard. Right? Midoriya took a deep breath and then hurried over to the robot. Don't worry, sir. We'll get you out of here as soon as we can. You're going to be fine. Okay, so what's the plan? Siro asked as he put on his helmet. Midoriya looked at the pile of boulders. We can't just push them off, they might roll on top of the civilian. Siro, Takoyami-san, can you two secure as much of the pile as possible? Tsuyu, grab the civilian and get ready to pull as soon as I move the rocks directly on top of him. Takoyami and Siro nodded first. The former had dark shadow wrap his arms around one section of stones, while the latter secured more with a thick web of tape. Sui hopped over to the robot and gave it a reassuring smile which was strange, considering how blank she usually kept her features and wrapped her tongue around its torso. Midoriya activated the Ultimatrix and cycled through his aliens until he found the one he wanted. 
Four arms, after cracking all of his knuckles, four arms braced himself against the boulders that were actually touching the robot. Okay, everyone get ready, those rocks could come down any second. On three, okay. One, two, three. With a mighty heave, four arms shifted the boulders, the rest of the pile shuddered. But Siro and Takoyami were prepared. Some of the smaller rocks started to fall, but Asui had already moved the robot to a safe distance. It's all coming down, Siro shouted. Siro, get Tatsuyu and cover her. Four arms braced himself. Takoyami, we need to block those rocks. Takoyami jumped to the side and behind four arms. Understood. Dark shadow. I'm on it. The sentient quirk readied his claws, just as several boulders started rolling towards them. Four arms punches shattered the larger rocks, while dark shadow swept aside the smaller ones. The landslide only lasted a few seconds, but it felt far longer. When it was over, even the stoic Takoyami was a little rattled. So, was that your first rock slide too? Midoriya asked when he turned back to normal. Takoyami nodded. I can't say it was pleasant, but at least it was in as close to a controlled environment as possible. Hey, speak for yourself. Dark Shadow didn't have a mouth, but he sounded pleased. I got to punch a seismic event. How often do you get to say you did that? He's not wrong. Midoriya admitted as they walked over to Siro, Asui, and the robot. How's the civilian? I've wrapped up his legs with my tape, Siro reported seriously. According to him, both his legs might be broken. We need to get him to the evacuation zone quickly. My tape might be good for keeping his bones from moving around. But he'll lose circulation if we don't hurry. Midoriya nodded. Okay, Takoyami-san, could Dark Shadow hold the civilian steady? Siro, Suyu and I will watch out for more rock slides. Thankfully, the rest of the walk was without incident, and they delivered the robots safely. As soon as they walked through the gate, several more robots dressed up as nurses hurried over and took the victim from them. Excellent work, 13 complimented. You could have reacted faster at the very beginning, but you were still quick to treat this as a real emergency, and a real civilian. You utilized your quirks well, and your teamwork was commendable. Well done, please take a moment to rest, and then head to the shipwreck zone. Midoriya and Asui shared an uncomfortable look, that was where they had really fought villains for the first time. And though they had emerged unscathed, it was far from a pleasant memory. When they arrived at the next test, it was All Might who spoke in their ears. Students, this time, the civilian is on a sinking ship. You have five minutes to rescue them, there is a small boat on the shore, but use your best judgment to succeed. Oh, and I should probably mention that this test is on an individual basis and will be reset after each attempt. Your time starts as soon as you either step onto the small boat or begin using your quirk. Is it just me? Or does All Might not seem like he knows what he's doing sometimes, Ribbit? Midoriya chuckled. W well, he did have those flashcards during the battle training. Maybe he's still new to being a teacher. Takoyami stepped forward first, but he took one look at the boat they were supposed to use and shook his head. Sensei, I am afraid that I have no experience in using a motorboat. I believe I could figure it out, given time, but in this case, that is time I do not have. I believe my best recourse would be to find another hero whose quirk or knowledge is better suited for this test. Not to worry, young Takoyami. Admitting your weaknesses is no weakness at all. Many heroes are unsuited for certain environments or conditions. You won't see Mount Lady trying to get people out of a cave-in, for example. You'll be docked points for not trying, of course, but you'll get some back for such a responsible decision. Takoyami bowed and then stepped aside. Siro went next, and he actually knew how to start the boat's engine. He was able to get to the sinking ship, climb up and rescue the civilian another robot and get back with seconds to spare. Asui and Midoriya had the easiest time of it. Asui just jumped into the water and swam over to the ship, then carried the civilian over the water with her tongue as she swam back. Midoriya turned into water hazard and did something similar. He had the robot wrap its arms around his neck as he became a living speedboat. When it came to the conflagration zone, a cityscape that was almost completely on fire, it was Asui who bowed out. Her physiology was too easily dried out by the fire, and waited patiently outside for the others to rescue civilians from burning buildings. When it was Midoriya's turn, he surprised Takoyami and Siro by turning into heat blasts. Hey, are you sure you want to just add more fire to the hellscape? Siro asked. Heat blast smiled sheepishly. Actually, I can absorb fire and shoot it back in this form. The two boys and one sentient quirk watched as heat blast calmly walked into a burning building. The fire flowed into his body, much like iron dust flowed to a magnet. When the flame died down, Heat Blast walked back out with the civilian close behind him. 
Siro and Takoyami had less dramatic, but no less successful rescues. They were both able to pull their civilians through windows with little difficulty, though Dark Shadow looked a little miserable when he withdrew back inside Takoyami. He is strengthened by darkness and weakened by light, Takoyami explained. The fire does provide some shadows, but it is more detrimental than helpful. After the conflagration zone, they went to the downpour zone. It was the opposite of the previous test in every way. The false city was bombarded by stinging rain, and it was difficult to see very far. This time, Ciro pulled out, he explained that his tape would become soaked and easily torn in this weather. However, while Midoriya rescued his civilian from a flooding car easily enough with human Gausor, it was Asui and Takoyami who stole the show. Asui was almost completely unaffected by the rain, though she did complain that it was a little cold as she brought her civilian back. In the darkness, Dark Shadow thrived, growing twice as large as normal and easily ripping open the door to the flooding basement that housed the last civilian. Though there were other test areas, the four of them were called back to the entrance after that. All Might was there, along with Yuraraka, whose costume was now repaired, Sato, Shoji and Hagakure, handing out mugs of hot chocolate. The downpour zone is usually the last test of the day, All Might said as the cold students warmed themselves up. Students don't like doing more when they're cold and wet. Yuraraka, who was drying herself off with a towel, nodded. Yeah, it wasn't fun. Poor Hagakure got stuck, and we couldn't find her for a while. It was awful. Hagakure wailed. She was bundled up with several towels, but was still shivering. I mean, Shoji-san found me, thanks, by the way. But I was stuck in the worst rain ever, and all I have are my gloves and boots. Midoriya blushed, and with his hood down, it was impossible to hide, so she really wasn't wearing any clothes. M maybe why you could ask the S Support D department to make you a costume that W works with your quirk. I tried. Hagakure sniffed, like she was about to cry. Power Loader Sensei said that my quirk was tricky, and they were still working on a costume that could turn invisible. All Might reached out to pat her, but then pulled back. After all, since Hagakure was invisible, he couldn't be completely sure where he was patting her. I'll put in a word with the support department and see if they can't put more focus on helping you, young Hagakure. Thanks, All Might Sensei. You're the best. All Might gave her his usual grin, and then turned to Midoriya's group. You'll receive individual scores and feedback later, but I want you all to know now that you did admirably. Siro shrugged. Thanks, but Midoriya was the only one who was able to do every test, so I guess he got the highest score. Not necessarily, All Might corrected. While it is true that young Midoriya's quirk makes him incredibly versatile, that comes with its own weakness. You'll get a more in-depth explanation in your review, young Midoriya, but something I noticed was that you often hesitated for a few seconds before choosing your form. Your sheer number of options is a bit overwhelming, yes. Th that's right, All Might Sensei, Midoriya admitted. I have a few forms that, uh, compete for certain situations I need to work on making snap decisions. All Might ruffled his hair. Better to be aware of this now, than when it matters in a life or death situation. Midoriya saw Ben in the corner of his eye, the hologram nodded. He's right, buddy, when lives are on the line, you should have a favorites list or something. If that doesn't work in the beginning, just slap the dial again and get the alien you need. Midoriya nodded. Got it. When it came to quirk combat, everyone wanted Midoriya as their sparring partner. All of his aliens meant that, if the other students needed to work on something in particular, he probably had a form that could help. One of his first matches was against Kirishima, who had practically begged him to use four arms. Please, Midoriya. The other boy was grinning almost maniacally. I know a form like that would be really good for strengthening my quirk, and I could use some experience fighting a guy with multiple limbs. Midoriya sighed, and shot an exasperated look at Yuraka when she giggled. Fine, but if I do this, I can't start off with my best punches. We need to see how much your hardening can take, I don't want to hurt you by accident. You got it. Hiroshima flexed, and his entire body took on a craggy, rocky appearance. Even his hair looked like it had been roughly carved from stone. Bring it on, Midoriya. After transforming, four arms brought one fist down right on top of Kirishima's guard. The blow sent him skidding back a few inches, but he stood tall. Come on, I barely felt that. Kirishima's grin grew even wider. If I'm gonna get better, I need to push my quirk past its limit. Four arms grimaced, but then Ben appeared in front of him. You heard the guy. Stop treating your classmates like glass. They want to be heroes just as much as you do. All right, fine. Four arms cocked back two of his fists, and Ben vanished. I hope you're as tough as you think you are, Kirishima. Both fists smashed through Kirishima's guard and into his chest. To four arms' surprise, the blow wasn't enough to knock Kirishima out of his hardening, though it did send him flying through the air and into a far wall. 
It took him a moment, but Kirishima pulled himself free. When he did, he looked ecstatic. That's what I'm talking about, Midoriya. But don't think I'll just let you keep on hitting me. I want to show you what I've got. Not everyone in the class was sparring at the same time. Jaira was sitting on a bench, drinking some water as she watched four arms and Kirishima go at it. You know, Midoriya never struck me as the meathead type, she commented. Yeyorazu shrugged. Jairo tried not to feel jealous of how graceful the other girl made such a simple gesture look. I don't think he is, Yeyorazu said. He may just be doing what Kirishima wants. Though Midoriya could stand to be a bit more aggressive, I suppose. With Kirishima, he has to be, or else he won't win. I think Kirishima knows this, which is why he's encouraging Midoriya so much. Jairo just raised an eyebrow. Or it has something to do with being manly that he's always talking about. That could also be it, Yeyorazu admitted. Changing topics a bit, I heard that some of our class is studying at your place. Oh, yes, well, sort of. We haven't actually done any academic work yet, but we agreed that we should all get together and study when we had to. If we're not studying, I suppose we're just spending time together. Gyro nodded. Do you think I could get in on that? I'm having trouble with some of my homework, and I don't want to fall behind. Yeyorazu smiled. Of course, I'm sure everyone would be happy to have you, look out. Before Jairo could think, Yeyorazu tackled her to the side. An instant later, a Kirishima-shaped missile crashed into the spot Jairo had been sitting. Oh, man. Four arms turned back to normal as he jogged up to them. I'm sorry, I didn't know you were there, and I was trying out a counter that Ajiro-san showed me, and... It's all right, Midoriya, Yeyorazu said as she helped Jairo to her feet. We're fine. Yeah, don't worry about it. Jairo gave him a thumbs up. Hey, Kirishima, you okay? I'm good, Kirishima said weakly as he got to his feet. Just got my bell rung. Give me a minute, and I'll be good to go again. Yeyorazu coughed into her hand. Perhaps you two could not destroy school property this time. The two boys looked at the shattered remains of the bench the girls had been sitting on and blushed. During the weekend, Midoriya and his friends met up at the Yeyorazu home again, this time to get their homework done. Waiting for them was not only Yeyorazu herself, but also Jairo. They had all been informed that Jairo had been invited as well, and no one had a problem. The petite girl had admitted that she wasn't sure about hanging out all the time, but she had nothing against studying with her classmates. Midoriya didn't mind, since group hangouts weren't for everyone. He still wasn't sure about it himself, beyond his immediate friends. That reminded him of something he'd been putting off until now, actually. Hey, Yamomo. Yeah, Yeyorazu looked up from her review of Yuraraka's chemistry homework. Yes, Izuku. What were you going to say before, about speaking in front of so many people? The thought still made him start to spiral into a panic, but Yuraraka grabbed his hand before he got too far. Oh, it's something simple that I found worked for me. Yeyorazu produced a spare piece of paper from her arm and drew a large circle. Just outside it, she drew a small dot. The circle is all the people you're addressing, and the dot is you. That didn't make Midoriya feel better, but Yeyorazu wasn't done. She drew a much smaller circle on the side closest to the dot. This small circle represents the people you're focusing on. They don't have to be physically present, but I've found that it's much easier to say a speech to people you care about. It helps tune out everyone else. Midoriya looked at the drawing and thought about it. Everyone would hear him, but who did he really want to address? To be honest, it really boiled down to those who had helped him so far. Ben, his mother, Nezu, the big three, and the friends around him now. Despite knowing most of the people on that list for barely two weeks now, he trusted them. They had stood up for him when they had barely known him, and they had faced very real dangers together. That formed a bond that he wouldn't easily give up. Thanks, Yamomo, he said. That really helps. Yeyorazu smiled warmly. I'm glad to hear it. Midoriya started to pull his hand free from Yuraraka's, though, for some reason. He was reluctant to, when his thumb accidentally brushed hers, which she'd kept free. Now under the effect of her quirk, Midoriya started to float away. Ah, uh, I'm sorry. Yuraraka blushed in embarrassment, but waited until Asui and Gyro secured the boy with tongue and earphone jacks, respectively, before releasing her quirk. Maybe I should start wearing gloves more often. Ashido snickered. If you're gonna keep holding Midori's hand, that might be a good idea. Most of the group laughed, while Midoriya and Yuraraka avoided eye contact for the rest of the day. The next week passed, and each day brought more and more anxiety for Class 1A. It was bad for most of them, but UAS rising stars were able to keep themselves grounded, either by talking to each other at school or messaging each other. On the night before the sports festival, they had one more chance for the latter. Book, is everyone ready? Comet, I am. Crayon, bring it on. Glasses, I look forward to giving my all. 
Tape, man, I'm so excited. Frog, me too, Ribbit. All Might, I'm still really nervous. Crayon, don't be, Midori. You are awesome, and I know you will do well. All Might, thanks. I think we all will. Comet, I know. Let's make a promise. All Might. Glasses. Tape. Look. Crayon. Frog. Ribbit. Tape. Damn it. Comet, let's all promise to meet up in the final round. Even if we have to face each other then, we'll still all be there together. Crayon. Aw, oh, that's sweet, Achako. You got a deal. Book, I agree. None of us are allowed to not make it to the final event. Tape, is that an order from the class president? Book, yes. All Might, seconded by the vice president. All Might, actually, there's something I want to say now, in case we don't have time tomorrow. All Might, it's kind of obvious, but I'm not very social. You all are the first real friends I've ever had. I know we haven't known each other that long, but I'm sure that I wouldn't be able to do what I've done without you. So thanks. Comet, sniff Deku-kun, that's so sweet. You're totally welcome. Book, I agree and echo that sentiment. You are all my best friends. Crayon, dang it, I'm gonna cry. Now I have two reasons to make it to the last round. Tape, glasses, frog, you're welcome, Izuku. I was hoping for a declaration of love for Achako, but what you said was nice, ribbit. Book, Sue, you just ruined the moment. Tape, eh, we were getting a little too emotional anyway. Thanks for lightening the mood, Suyu. Frog, ribbit. Tape, oh come on, that one wasn't even attached to anything. Crayon, um, Midori and Achako haven't said anything. They okay. Glasses, going by past experience, I would say that Izuku is probably having a breakdown from Tsuyu's comment, and Achako is floating through the air. Frog, tension broken, mission accomplished. Good night, everyone, and good luck tomorrow. Frog, ribbit. Tape, why? Just, you know what? I'm going to bed. Frogs are going to haunt my nightmares now, I just know it. Izuku tried to start his day like he would any other he got up, showered, ate his breakfast, brushed his teeth, and tried not to think about everything that could go wrong. What if I mess up my speech? What if I don't move on from the first event? What if I make a fool of myself? Ben shared an exasperated look with Inko. The boy had been like that all morning. Hey, buddy. Izuku glanced up at Ben. Maybe you should ask yourself these questions instead. What if your speech goes off without a hitch? What if you win the whole thing? What if you look awesome in front of the whole country? Izuku blinked. He hadn't really thought about it like that. He often focused on the worst possible scenarios and never the best. That, that would be cool, he admitted. Ben gestured toward him in a there-you-go manner. All right, then make it happen. Simple as that. Izuku smiled. It was tiny, but it was there. Are you sure you're a tutorial program for heroes and not a counselor? Ben grinned right back. Dude, I've had to deal with you for almost a year now. I am more than capable of learning. Inko laughed. Okay, boys, that's enough. If you don't hurry, you'll miss the train, and I'm sure you don't want that today of all days. Right? Thanks, Mom. Izuku darted off to finish getting ready. Inko turned to Ben. How do you think he'll do? Honestly, Ben shrugged. I don't know. He's been training, and he's got good instincts, but a lot of his competition has spent most of their lives getting ready for this. As long as he thinks things through and doesn't get overwhelmed, I think he'll do fine. If he's smart, he'll win the whole thing. Inko nodded. Thank you. Her son, now ready, ran past her towards the door. Oh, Izuku. Yeah, mom. Izuku was surprised when his mother hugged him tightly. I don't know if I've said this before, but I want to apologize, Inko said. When you found out you were quirkless and asked me if you could still be a hero, all I said was that I was sorry. I want you to know now, even if you'd never found that watch, that I am so proud of you. I'm proud of the hero that I know you'll be. I love you so much, Izuku. Izuku tried to hold back his tears as he hugged her back. Thanks, mom. I love you too. Pinko rubbed her eyes as she stepped back. Now, go out there and show the whole world what I already know. Izuku nodded and left the house, but Ben's hologram stayed behind. I'll keep an eye on him, just in case. Thank you, Inko said. But, please, try to enjoy yourself while you're at the sports festival. Ben grinned. Hey, helping your son is my primary function. Doing that makes me happy. Inko was about to argue with him, but Ben suddenly flickered wildly for a moment. What was that? Ben looked down at his hands. Oh, Izuku is pushing the limits of how far I can extend my hologram. No big deal. I'll see you after the festival is over. Inko smiled as Ben vanished, never knowing that he had just lied to her face. Midoriya's leg nervously bounced up and down as he and the rest of Class 1 awaited for their turn to head to the arena entrance. As soon as they had arrived at UA, they had been directed to change into their gym clothes and wait. 
for most of them. Costumes and support items were banned in the interest of fairness, but some, like Ayama and Midoriya, kept the latter since they needed them in order to use their abilities at all. Relax, Midoriya, Yeirazu said for the tenth time. Just keep doing those breathing exercises or focus on something else like quirk analysis. Midoriya nodded shakily. Why you're right, Yamomo. He pulled out his newest notebook and started jotting something down. I needed to write down some ideas I wanted to run by Yuraraka for her quirk later. Yuraraka leaned over to read his notes. Ooh, can I see? Midoriya leaned back. Yuraraka hadn't realized how close her face was to his. Uh, it was going to be a surprise. That wasn't completely true. But it did make Yuraraka move back without him having to be rude. Cool. I can't wait. Midoriya. Todoroki's voice behind him made Midoriya jump, and he turned around. The other boy was standing with his arms at his sides, his fists clenched. Why yes, Todoroki-san. Midoriya stood up, something told him that Todoroki was on edge, and he wanted to be ready. I don't think I'd be too far off the mark if I said you were the strongest student in our class. Todoroki's gaze sharpened to a razor's edge. In fact, outside of the big three, you might be the most powerful student in the entire school. Midoriya opened his mouth to say something, but Todoroki kept going. That's why I want to challenge you. Here, in the sports festival, I want to prove that I can beat anyone without breaking my oath. He turned and walked away. That's all I wanted to say. If that's the case, Midoriya found himself saying, and Todoroki stopped. Then I should say something too I'm going to do my best to win out there. If you and I go against each other, just know that I won't give you an easy win. For an instant, Todoroki's expression could almost be called amused. I'd be disappointed if you did. On the other side of the room, Kirishima kept a firm grasp on Bakugo's shoulder. The other boy was twitching and barely contained fury. What does that icy hot bastard think he's doing? He called out Deku, but not me. That nerd is the only one who's beaten me at anything in this school, and my grades are even better. F. Deku is only the third best student in the class, behind me in Ponytail. Icy Hot should be challenging all of the top students, not just Deku. Bakugo's fists tightened so hard that it hurt. I'll show him it was a mistake to underestimate me. Once Todoroki had returned to his corner, Midoriya sank back into his chair. Siro tapped his shoulder. Dude, you okay? Midoriya nodded shakily. Why yeah, I'm fine. Todoroki-san was just really intense. Siro glanced back at the boy in question. What was that oath he mentioned? Ah, I believe I know. Ida pushed up his glasses. I recall Todoroki-san saying that he refused to use the fire-related part of his quirk during combat and would only use ice. Yeyurazu frowned. Why would he handicap himself like that? I don't know, Ribbit, Asui said. I just hope I don't have to fight him. I don't like cold. Ashido huffed a laugh. I don't think any of us want to fight Todoroki. I mean, I guess I could melt his ice, like we talked about. During the last time they were all at Yeyurazu's house, they had created scenarios where they had to fight their classmates or people with quirks like those of our classmates, as Midoriya had politely put it. For Ashido, it depended on whether or not her acid would give out before Todoroki's ice. Further conversation was halted when an announcement came up in their room, telling them all to head to the arena's entrance. As the students filed out, Midoriya and his friends lingered. So good luck, everyone, he said. Whatever happens, we're still friends, right? Of course we are, silly. Ashido wrapped her arms around him. Come on, guys, group hug before we head out. Yeyurazu and Siro were quick to join in. Uraraka snagged Ida and dragged him into the hug before he could back out. And Asui hugged him from behind so that he couldn't pull free. Midoriya went red-faced for a moment, especially with Ashido, Uraraka and Yeyurazu directly pressed against him. But he quickly found himself drawing comfort from the group hug. It was nice beyond words to have people who genuinely cared about him, and he cared for them just as much. All right, everyone, Midoriya said, with more confidence than he'd had before. Let's show everyone what the rising stars can do. His friends all raised a fist into the air. Yeah, and now, the indomitable students who fought off villains on their first week of school. Let's give a big hand for Class 1A. Upon hearing present Mike's words, Midoriya and Yeyurazu led their class out into the open air. Midoriya resisted the urge to shield his eyes from the bright morning light, as well as the urge to shrink in on himself as thousands of people applauded and cheered. Oh, wow. Iraraka looked around in obvious awe. I knew there would be a lot of people, but actually being here makes it all so real, right? Midoriya didn't answer. He was doing his best to keep his mind on his speech, more importantly. He was trying to stay focused on who he was giving the speech to. Class 1A took its place at the head of the hundreds of students who were competing in the sports festival. Midoriya noted the purple-haired boy from before among the general studies classes, said boy smirked as the hero course students assembled. 
but his eyes were sharp and calculating. And now, introducing the referee for the freshman events this year, it's the R-rated hero, Midnight. Midoriya had seen Midnight before, she was the art history teacher, and she was actually quite good at her job. That was surprising, though it did lend credence to the old phrase don't judge a book by its cover. She was a beautiful woman, with long, dark hair, slanted glasses, and a skin-tight outfit that left little to the imagination. To make her even more provocative, she increased the potency of her quirk by exposing more skin, which meant that she would often tear parts of her costume. As Midnight walked up to the podium, she struck a pose and winked. All of you better behave, or you'll be punished. Even Minda looked nervous when Midnight swept her hungry gaze across the crowd of students. If she's R-rated, should she really be teaching at a high school? Asked one student, who obviously didn't attend any of her classes. Midnight glared at the student in question and waved her flogger-style whip. Hey, my teaching credentials are completely above the radar. She quickly composed herself and brought the microphone up to her mouth. Now, freshman representative Midoriya Izuku, come on up here and say a few words. Midoriya took a deep breath, this was it. He started walking towards midnight. He thought that Yuraka had brushed her hand against his as he moved past, but he figured that he'd just imagined it. Despite how she usually acted, Midnight did care about her students, so when the microphone couldn't pick up her words, she gave him a small, understanding smile. Good luck, Midoriya-san, just remember to breathe. Midoriya nodded, and remembered what Yeyarazu had advised. He focused not on the cameras that were broadcasting his image across Japan and much of the world and not on the throngs of people in the stands. He didn't even focus on most of the other students in front of him. Instead, he focused on the six people and one hologram present whom he could safely call his best friends. Everyone expects us to give our best today. He began. The world wants us to put on a good show, and UA wants us to make our school proud. Naturally, we're going to do that. The joking tone in his voice at that last part had a few people chuckling. But, as we at UA are so fond of saying, we go beyond. Today, it's not just about making our school proud, it's about making ourselves proud. Do the absolute best you can, shoot for the top, and no matter what happens, you'll all prove that you deserve to be students here. He raised a fist into the air. Plus Ultra, his actions and words were mirrored not just by many of the students, but also a fair few in the audience, especially UA alumni. With his piece said, Midoriya headed back to his class, all the while trying not to shake uncontrollably. He'd managed to say his speech without stuttering, but all those nerves were coming back at once. That was great, Deku-kun, Yuraka whispered. Midoriya took a moment to try and steady himself. Thanks, Yuraka. Honestly, I think competing in the actual events will be less scary after all that. All right, everyone. Midnight waved behind her, and a large screen rose up from a slot in the podium. It's time to find out what the first event will be, students. Will it be right up your alley, or will it push you to your limits? A number of flashing symbols and words flew across the screen, too fast for Midoriya to identify. Finally, the screen settled on two words. Obstacle course. Present Mike shouted. The aim may be simple, to get from start to finish, but that's what the obstacles are for. All students, head to the starting line. The first one back to the stadium will be the winner of the first round, and only the top 42 will move on to the second round. Remember, use of quirks is permitted, but any serious injuries caused to fellow competitors is grounds for elimination. Good luck, kids. There was a shuffling sound, followed by a tired sigh. Also, joining me in commentary is my fellow teacher and pro hero, Eraserhead. Why am I here? Did I do something to you in a past life or something? Probably not, or else I wouldn't have had to try so hard to get you here. Come on, where's that smile? Dead in a ditch somewhere. Now, if you're not going to let me take a nap, let's just do our job. The third year events were later in the day, but that didn't stop the big three from coming in early. They had claimed the waiting room for themselves, not because they thought they deserved it, but because they could watch their favorite first year student compete without interruption. Hey, that was a great speech. Hato floated over the boys so that she could get a better look at the footage on Tagata's phone. What do you think he'll use for the race, huh? Tagata tapped his chin. My first guess would be that super fast one we saw on the first day of school. But Midoriya is full of surprises. He might have a form we haven't seen yet. He still hasn't shown me one of his flying ones, Hato pouted. I want my flying buddy. I'm a jicky side. To be fair, I don't think he's had a chance to use one yet. If I was him, I'd use it now, though. Tagata grinned. I just hope the kid makes it to the second round. He can't make a big splash if he doesn't get past this one. There was no more time to talk to his friends. By the time everyone had shuffled to the starting line, Midoriya had been separated from them anyway. 
the different classes had been purposely meshed together to prevent students from combining their efforts at the beginning. It was meant to provide a level playing field for the non-hero students, but Midoriya admitted that he would have liked to at least start with one of his friends. Don't worry, Ben said from the Ultimatrix. You've got this. You know what alien you'll use here, so don't think about anything else. Midoriya nodded absently, and his hand rested above the dial. All he had to do was wait for. 3, 2, 1, go. Just before Midoriya could react, cold air flooded the starting line, and then a mass of ice exploded outward, sealing up most of the entrance to the tunnel. Todoroki didn't even look back as his ice propelled him forward. However, his move wasn't enough to stop all of the students, especially those who were prepared. That was a dirty trick, Todoroki. Yeyorazu shouted as she used a long pole from her hand to vault through a gap in the ice. Siro was right behind her, as was Asui. Bakugo blew a massive hole in the ice and then launched himself into the air. Get back here, icy hot. More and more students poured through the gap Bakugo had created. In the rush to get outside, most didn't notice the green flash of light. What they did notice was the red blur that flew over them. Jetre, holy smokes, folks, that's Midoriya Izuku that just flew past most. Scratch that. He just flew past all of the other students. Can we get a shot of his transformation in slow motion? Please. On television screens, computers and phones, people all over the world got their first glimpse at one of Midoriya's aliens. This one looked like a red humanoid stingray, with yellow horns and wing membranes, clawed hands at the end of his wings, and jagged teeth under green eyes. Even with the camera slowing down the image, it was clear that Jetre was moving at incredible speeds. Hado clapped her hands in delight. Yes, finally, my flying buddy is here. Tagata grinned. Man, can you believe that speed? He might be moving faster than all might. Amajiki watched with wide eyes. I think you're right. In another part of the country, a man sat up in interest. He had been watching the sports festival on his phone simply because, for once, he had nothing better to do. Now, he was glad that he did, because the plain, nervous kid from the opening ceremony had suddenly turned into something almost alien in appearance. What really interested him, however, was how fast the boy was moving through the air. He pulled a sheet of paper from his desk and scribbled out Midoriya Izuku, followed by a question mark. He would keep an eye on that one, and if he was lucky, one or two others in his class would catch his attention as well. Looks like Midoriya is going to be the first to encounter the opening obstacle, Robo Inferno. That's a stupid name. It sounds like they're about to dance, not stop the competitors. Jetre saw the robots coming before anyone else. To him, those villain stand-ins from the entrance exam were moving in slow motion. Rather than try to fight his way through them, he just flew over them before even the zero pointers could swat him out of the sky. A logical move, Aizawa commented. Midoriya now holds a sizable lead over the others. Fighting those robots would just give that lead up. And since none of the other competitors can fly like Midoriya, they'll have to fight their way through. Either way, the kid leading the pack is just going to keep on leading. Todoroki scowled. He had thought that his initial move would give him plenty of space ahead of the others, but he was wrong. Midoriya had transformed into something perfectly suited for this race, and then took the lead because of course he did, and more than a few of the others were hot on his tail. Bakugo was closest, but Ida and Yeyorazu were leading the rest of the students. Once again, Todoroki opened a path for himself by creating huge spikes of ice that drove the robots apart, and then kept on going. Bakugo blew the head off one robot that got in his way, but never actually stopped. Most of the other students were fast enough to avoid the robots, but the slower ones had to fight. One robot in particular, after getting shorted out by Kaminari, fell directly onto two students. Oh my god. One student shouted in horror. Can people actually die on this? Immediately, Kirishima broke through the metal plating of the robot. He had used his hardening to protect himself just in time. Like hell I'd die. He glared at Kaminari. Dude, that wasn't cool. Kaminari, who had used a good deal of his quirk to stop the robot, gave a slightly loopy smile. Sorry, look at that, folks. That's Kirishima Ijiro of Class 1A. With his quirk, he's like the ultimate shield and the ultimate spear. Another student, one who looked remarkably like Kirishima, but with metal skin, burst out from under the robot as well. What the hell, Class 1A? Anyone else might have died. And there's Tetsu 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 of Class 1B. His quirk also turns him into the ultimate shield and ultimate spear. Hiroshima groaned as he began running again. Come on, I have enough trouble standing out as it is. Up in a private booth, All Might watched the first event with Night Eye in Gran Torino. For once, he looked smug rather than nervous alongside the other men. I told you he'd do well. Night Eye merely raised an eyebrow. Judging by your reaction when the boy transformed, 
That one is new to you. I never bet one which transformation he'd use, only that he'd do well. Gran Torino, on the other hand, watched with interest as Midori across the second part of the race. He's fast in that form. Actually, Toshinori, I'd say he's faster than you were in your prime. Going by his movements, he's probably not as maneuverable as you were. But if it came down to a race down a straight path, my money would be on him. All Might nodded, a little more serious now. I can think of maybe one or two other heroes who can come close to that kind of speed these days, and that's being generous. How many heroes do you think will send him offers? Night I asked, less out of actual interest, and more because longer conversations between them were still rare. Many will try simply to gain the prestige of having such a unique student interning with them. Probably less than you'd think, Gran Torino argued. If the boy shows off more of his forms, he might scare off a lot of the smaller agencies. They'll think he's out of their league. All Might shrugged. I have a feeling that many will at least make offers, but they won't expect him to accept. If I were in his position, I'd only take an internship under a hero who is either successful, experienced, or both. Gran Torino raised an eyebrow. Will you make an offer, Tashinori? No, as a teacher, I can't. All Might sighed wistfully. It would be nice, though. Young Midoriya knows about my true form, but he needs someone who can go out on patrol for more than a couple hours every day. He shrugged again when the other men gave him alarmed looks. My limit has been dropping steadily, ever since I passed on one for all to young Mirio. If I push it, I can make it about two and a half hours, but I can safely manage two without feeling terrible afterwards. Night I awkwardly reached out for the man's shoulder. All might. The fading symbol of peace smiled sadly and shook his head. Please, let's not think about it today. I'd like to enjoy seeing the next generation of heroes get their start. Are you kidding me? Iroraka asked as she made it to the second leg of the race. It was a massive canyon, interspersed with columns and ropes. Welcome, students, to the fall. Present Mike sounded almost gleeful. If you don't land right, or if you fall off, you're out. Don't worry, you probably won't die. But you all might want to hurry it up. Midoriya has already made it to the third and final leg of the race. Then we'd better hurry up, Ribbit. Asui hopped onto a rope and easily crossed it. This is my time to shine. Iroraka used her quirk on herself for a few seconds to get a bounding leap, but was nearly knocked off course by a pink-haired girl who was completely decked out in support items. Hey, how come she gets all that stuff? Siro asked as he swung from one column to another on his tape. I'm in the support course. The girl shouted over her shoulder as she literally flew on boot-mounted thrusters. We're allowed to use any equipment we've built. Yuraka released her quirk and rolled to a safe landing on a pillar. She couldn't help but shoot an envious glance at the grappling pittons and wires the pink-haired girl was using to guide her movements. That would probably come in handy for me, she mused. Maybe I can run that idea by Deku-kun later. She put a pin in that thought for later, as long as she made it to the next round. She could ask him without feeling like she failed. Well, folks, I'm not sure if you're surprised that Midoriya has made it to the final stretch, but I know I'm not. Since he's flying, he can avoid the mines we set up, but we've still got a special little something for anyone whose quirks let them fly for long periods of time. Let's hope Midoriya is as acrobatic as he is fast. Jetray barely had time to wonder what present Mike was talking about when dozens of guns emerged from underground alongside the minefield and opened fire. Are they trying to kill me? Jetray thought, but only winced when a clay pigeon glanced against his side. Oh, I see, still hurts, though. Rather than try to maneuver wildly through the air, Jetray focused on the pigeons that were going to be directly in his path. His eyes glowed green, and then fired bolts of energy that shattered the clay into dust. Oh, now that's a surprise, present Mike commented. It seems Midoriya has more than speed and flight up his non-existent sleeves. He's deliberately not mentioning that you've got more than Jetray to turn into, Ben said. If the crowd thinks you're cool now, just wait until the next event. You aren't helping. Jetre muttered as he shot his way through more clay pigeons. You want help? Fine, the finish line is coming up in 10 seconds. Thanks. Jetre swooped in low, under the gun's arcs of fire, and made his way into the tunnel that led back to the stadium. As a last second idea for Flair, he transformed back to human while still flying, and skidded into the stadium like it was a stage. The crowd loved it. The stadium erupted with cheers and applause. It wasn't just the people in the audience, though. Two of the big three were celebrating like Midoriya had already won. Inko was sobbing uncontrollably when she saw her son on television, and halfway around the world. A man who hadn't seen his son in person in over two years couldn't stop his own tears from falling down his face. Midoriya was receiving attention from more than just friendly parties, though. In his cramped room, Shigaraki Tamura glared hatefully at the boy who was tentatively waving to the crowd. He remembered the pain of diamond shards hitting his arm 
and his hands rose to his neck as he scratched his skin bloody. That brat, he hissed, I can't believe Sensei wants me to watch this crap. Even if it means I can study that freak's quirks, all I want is for him to lose. A fair distance away from the stadium, two more people watched the sports festival. One was a young man, and the other was a girl in her late teens. Not bad, the man said. You say that like he was challenged, the girl said, unimpressed. In fact, I don't think anyone in his class was slowed down much. Still, it looks like he's being responsible with the Ultimatrix, so he probably met the criteria for the selection. Asmuth will be happy, anyway, considering he double-checked the parameters, so ha. Huh? The girl gave him a slightly alarmed look. What is it? Something else is going on. I'll be right back, let me know if I miss anything cool. There was a flash of green light, and the man vanished. The girl scoffed. Show off. That's our first place winner, folks. Midoriya Izuku has taken the sports festival by storm. He not only won the first event with a huge gap between him and the other competitors, he may have set a record for first-year students. What do you think, my not-so-enthusiastic co-commentator? I think Midoriya isn't the only one to watch out for. Just because he won the first event doesn't mean he'll continue to do well. He's got a point, Ben said. Don't get cocky. Right, I got it. Midoriya had no plans to underestimate anyone. In his mind, anyone's quirk could beat his aliens if properly utilized. So he had to be careful. Midoriya's lead was so far ahead of the others that he had a few minutes to kick back and relax. It gave him time to think about something that he'd been toying with since before the sports festival began. Hey, Ben. He said, barely moving his lips to avoid looking crazy. Yeah. Ben appeared in front of him, holding up a green foam finger that had go Midoriya. Printed on it. I want you to stop giving me advice for the festival. The foam finger vanished, and Ben raised an eyebrow. If you want, sure, but I'd like to know why. This is, this is my chance to really prove myself to myself, if that makes sense. I want to show that I can do things without you or someone else holding my hand. To his surprise, Ben smiled with obvious pride. Izuku, I've been hoping you'd do that at some point. Really? Yeah, my entire purpose is to get you started, not guide you through every step. Once you can really stand on your own two feet, then I will have achieved my primary directive. As an AI, that's the height of my existence. Oh, what happens after that? Ben shrugged. I dunno, maybe I'll kick back and watch you be an awesome hero. It'll be like going to the movies for me, only I can't get snacks. A tub of popcorn appeared in his hands, and he put a piece in his mouth. I mean, I can, I just don't eat. Midoriya fought back a laugh. Oh, and there was one other thing I wanted to talk to you about. Look at that, folks. Present Mike shouted. The rest of the competitors are making their way into the arena. Who's going to make it into the next stage? The first of the other students to finish the race was Todoroki, only barely edging out Bakugo. Both boys were panting heavily but they were in better shape than Midoriya was while human, so it only took them a few minutes to recover. Thirty seconds after them was Ida, who somehow managed to look proud and disappointed at the same time probably because, while he'd managed to make it into the top five, winning races like this was his thing. Midoriya couldn't help but grin as the rest of his friends showed up. UAS Rising Stars had all made it into the top twenty, at least. Even better, his entire class had made it to the second round, all of 1B had also passed, along with the general studies student, and a pink-haired girl that Midoriya didn't recognize. This isn't a surprise, Eraser had said. The hero course students usually take up the vast majority of the slots for the second event. It's a logical outcome. Those students usually have quirks better suited to practical applications, such as races and combat. They also tend to be in better shape than the average student. Midoriya ran up to his friends. Guys, you all made it. But of course we did, Deku-kun, Yuraka panted. We made a promise, right? Right you are, Achako. Ashido danced around the others in excitement. Ooh, we made it to the second round on our very first sports festival. This is awesome. What do you get off of me, you little creep? Midoriya and his friends turned to see an orange-haired girl from 1B wave around an oversized hand. Attached to that hand by his sticky balls was Minta, who had a black eye. No way, the boy shouted. I got into the second event by doing this. That doesn't explain why you're still touching me. Asui sighed. Why do I get the feeling that every girl in school is going to get a restraining order on him by the end of the year, Ribbit? Yeyurazu scowled. Because he is the worst, simple as that. You know, he's getting better, Siro said, though he sounded like he couldn't believe his own words. Kaminari asked him if he wanted to, and I'm quoting him here, check out the babes on the beach with him on Friday, and Minta said he was busy studying. 
Everyone glanced back at Maita, who was still stuck on the girl's hand and grinning lecherously. I don't believe it, Asui said. Siro, did you smell toast when you overheard that conversation, Ribbit? I wasn't having a stroke. Siro paused. I mean, I checked, just in case, but I wasn't. Midoriya couldn't help but laugh, and his friends joined in. The laughter faded when Midnight called for their attention, and the placements were shown on the screen. Midoriya noted all 41 other competitors, but he checked on his friends first. Ida had come in fourth place, Yeirazu had come in sixth, Siro had come in seventh, Ashido had come in thirteenth, Asui had gotten seventeenth, and Yuraraka had nabbed twentieth place. Ashido pouted, I would have gotten a better spot, but I hit one of the mines at the last second. Me, too, Yuraraka said, and rubbed a sore spot on her leg. I had to slow down and figure out my jumps carefully, Ribbit Asui said and I could only do short hops anyway. Yeah, same with me, Ciro added. My tape didn't set off any mines, but I would have if I'd landed on one. All right, kids, enough chit-chat. Midnight called out, getting everyone's attention. It's time to announce the next event. Once again, the screen behind Midnight began to show random words, before finally settling on cavalry battle. Next to Midoriya, Ben raised an eyebrow. Okay, I'm stumped. What's this? Thankfully, Midnight was there to explain. In theory, this event is like the playground game. Some students will be the horse that carries the rider. However, there's a bit more to it. Each team will be made up of two to four competitors. And whoever is the rider will carry the objective of the game the collective points you all earned. You see, each of you received a number of points, equal to your ranking on the board. We started at five, and went up by five for every spot. For this event, you'll have to steal as many points as you can, and defend your own points at the same time. Only the top four teams will advance to the final event. Okay, so I have 210 points, Midoriya thought. It might be the highest number, but you could easily take the lead by going after a few other teams. Sounds fair. Oh, and we made a special change for the lucky student who got first place. Midnight smiled in a way that made many of them uncomfortable. You see, the student who got first place is worth 10 million points. Midoriya froze, and he was distinctly aware of 41 pairs of eyes locking onto him. I'm in trouble. Okay, I'm back. The girl crossed her arms. What were you doing? Taking care of something, like I said. You did something you weren't supposed to, didn't you? As long as you don't know what I did, you can't tell anyone. We're only supposed to observe. Nobody saw me. I think. I'm pretty sure. You're dead when we get home. Wouldn't be the first time. The girl drew back her fist and punched him in the arm. Don't ever bring that up again. Right? Sorry. Let's just watch the next event. So, I guess you'll all be going to other teams, right? Yuraraka frowned. What are you talking about, Deku-kun? Midoriya shrugged. I mean, with my 10 million points, anyone on my team is going to have a huge target on their backs. You guys are going to have an easier time if you... Stop that, Izuku. Yuraraka looked furious as she poked him in the chest. It did not go unnoticed that she used his real name when she was angry. I'm not going to abandon you. What kind of friend would I be if I left when things got hard? Midoriya tried to hide the tears in his eyes and failed miserably. His friends smiled at him fondly, but Siro had to break up the moment. Sorry, but Midoriya does have a point, kind of. Siro shrugged. The teams can only have four people at most, which means we'll have to split up. He is right, Ida said. As much I want us all to meet up in the final round, I also want to show my own strength. As such, I will be joining a different team. I hope you can understand, Midoriya. I get it, Midoriya said. Good luck, Ida. I'm sorry, but I also want to compete against you, Midoriya, Yeyarazu said, voice full of remorse. As much as I care about all of you, this sports festival is a chance for me to show what I can do on my own. She worked up a smile. I still expect all of us to make it to the final round. Yeah, I kinda feel the same way, Ashido and Siro said at the same time. The two of them shared a grin. Wanna find another team? Siro asked. Sure. Ashido waved at the others as she and Siro dashed off. See you guys in the final event. As more of his friends split off, Midoriya got increasingly nervous. Asui tapped him on the arm and smiled. Don't worry, Ribbit, I'll stay with you and Achako. Midoriya smiled back. Thanks, Suyu. Yuraka nodded. Great. What do you think, Deku-kun? Should we get another person, or will three be enough? Midoriya thought about it, but was interrupted by a loud voice in his ear. Hey, you, Mr. Ten Million. Midoriya whirled and found the pink-haired girl well within his personal space, her face nearly touching his own. Gah. Midoriya held a hand over his racing heart. WH who are you? Oh, right, I forgot to introduce myself. The girl grinned and lifted her goggles onto her forehead. Midoriya noticed that her pupils had odd markings that looked like crosshairs, perhaps something to do with her quirk. 
Patsume, support course student and inventor extraordinaire at your service. I want to join your team, and I need to know who made that watch for you, because I've never seen a support item like that before. Yuraka put herself between Hatsume and Midoriya protectively. Why do you want to join the team with the biggest target? Undaunted by the other girl's attitude, Hatsume grinned. Ooh, a discerning customer. Well, I figure that more eyes will be on your team than the others, and that gives me more opportunities to show off my babies. Also, I'm a girl who really appreciates fine craftsmanship, and that watch has got to be one of the best I've ever seen. W well, my watch was made by my cousin in America, but I don't know much about how it works. Midoriya blinked as something Hatsum said registered. Um, what are you talking about when you say babies? Like this, Hatsum pointed to a belt around her stomach. This baby, for example, can fire a high tensile strength wire with grappling pittons to secure your footing, trip up a villain, or save a civilian. Interested now, Midoriya looked at the bewildering array of support items Hatsum sported, and then at Yuraraka and Asui. A moment later, he smiled. It wasn't his typical unsure smile, but a smile that came with having a really good idea. All right, he said slowly, I think I have a plan. Okay, now I'm starting to feel bad, Ashido whined. How are all the teams filled up so fast? Probably because everyone's teaming up with people they know, Siro said. That means a lot of them were coming up with teams as soon as the event was announced. Well, crap, maybe we should have stayed with Midori. Hey, guys. Ashido and Siro turned around and saw Kirishima running towards them. Have you two joined a team yet? Um, uh, no, Siro said. Are you inviting us? Yes, please. Kirishima put his hands together and bowed his head. Beck Hugo and I need some help, and I told him I'd ask around, and... Whoa, hold on a second. Ashido narrowed her eyes at him. Beck Hugo, you teamed up with Beck Hugo. Kirishima, you're one of the most upstanding guys I've ever met. Why would you team up with him? Ashido wasn't stupid. She'd suspected that Bakugo had bullied Midoriya even before she found out why the latter had been nicknamed Deku. It infuriated her that nothing had been done about it beforehand, and that someone like him had been accepted into UA. Even now, he barely towed the line, at least he was smart enough not to cross it, but there was every chance he could get pushed over the edge. Either way, she didn't like him. Kirishima grimaced. I know, Bakugo is. Well, he's Bakugo. I'm not excusing him, but I did tell him that he'd have to watch his mouth around our teammates, or I'd ditch him, and he'd have nobody for this event. He promised that he would, and he doesn't seem the type to go back on his word. Come on, please. Ashido glanced at Siro. The boy had a frighteningly good poker face, his expression neutral and unreadable. He only offered her a brief nod, he was in if she was. All right, fine, Ashido huffed. Let's go. Hiroshima pumped a fist. Sweet. Thank you so much, you guys won't regret it. He grabbed them both by the wrist and half dragged them off. Bekubro, I told you I'd get a couple extra teammates. Bakugo scowled at the nickname, but didn't snap back. Instead, he looked at the two newcomers. Huh? Two of Deku's friends. What are your quirks again? Siro was still doing his best not to react, but Ashido frowned when Bakugo used Midoriya's nickname. When used by Yuraraka, it was cute, but Bakugo made the name sound like a curse. Still, as much as she hated to admit it and she really hated to admit it Bakugo was skilled. Teaming up with him would be the best way to ensure that she and Siro could keep their promise and see their friends in the final event. I can make acid, either for mobility or attack, she said through gritted teeth. When Siro spoke, it was with a far calmer tone than what Ashido knew he was really feeling. I can make strands of tape. It's pretty strong, strong enough to hold most people. Bakugo nodded. He brought one hand to his chin and started to pace. Okay, I think I've got a plan. Hiroshima will be the front of the horse, and he'll be carrying me. We can use him like a ram if things get up close. We're gonna try to keep that from happening. I'll be the airstrike. Sticky, you'll pull me back so that I don't hit the ground and get disqualified. Raccoon Eyes, your job will be to watch our flanks, trip em up or make em burn. I don't care, just keep the other teams off our asses. My name is Ishido Mina, use it or we're going to have a problem. Bakugo just raised an eyebrow. Whatever. Hiroshima intervened before things got heated. Hey, Bakugo, what's our plan? Are we going after Midoriya's team? Or what? Don't be stupid, Bakugo said dismissively. Of course we're hitting Deku's team. We'll take his 10 million points, and then I'll blow away any moron dumb enough to try and steal it from us. Raccoon Eyes will keep up the defense, and Sticky can trip up people when he's not busy helping me. Ashido narrowed her eyes in anger, but before she could take more than a step in Bakugo's direction, Siro put a hand on her shoulder. Let it go for now, he whispered. Remember, we're using him as much as he's using us. All we have to do is make it to the next round. Ashido nodded. I only have to put up with him for a little while. 
Just remember that Midori had to deal with him for a lot longer. If he can do that, I can do this. Yay Yorazu san Ida san The students in question turned and saw Todoroki walking up to them. Do you two have a team yet? Yay Yorazu answered for both of them. No, we were looking to see if. I want you both on mine. Todoroki jerked his thumb over his shoulder at Takoyami, who was leaning against a nearby wall. I've already got Takoyami-san. My ice and his dark shadow should work well with your speed, Ida-san, and your versatility, Yeyorazu-san. You're trying to make as balanced a team as possible, Yeyorazu observed. Ida was more accusatory. You want to be able to react to anything Midoriya may turn into. To their surprise, Todoroki shook his head. No, everyone else is going to go after his team, and we don't want to get bogged down in that free-for-all. Instead, we're going to go after the teams on the periphery, building up as many points as we can that way. He shrugged. Of course, if Midoriya messes up, I'll be more than happy to take the 10 million points from him. Ida and Yeyorazu frowned not because Todoroki's plan was a bad one, but because they didn't want Midoriya to lose the 10 million points. If he did, there was a good chance he and his team wouldn't move on to the next round, and all of them would feel terrible if they broke their promise. Very well, Todoroki-san, Yeyorazu said, we'll join your team. Todoroki just nodded and moved back to Takoyami. Well, he was curt, Yeyorazu commented. But he is one of the most powerful students in our class, Ida said. And his strategy is sound. Takoyami is also very strong. And with us added to the team, we have a very good chance of advancing to the next round. Yeyorazu glanced back and saw Midoriya speaking enthusiastically with Yuraraka, Asui, and a pink-haired girl that she didn't recognize. At least he looked less apprehensive than before. That was good. She had worried that he would fall apart if he didn't have all of his friends supporting him. She shook the thoughts away for now. It's time to stop worrying about Izuku for now. This is about my future. Come on, guys. I think we should find another person. Kendo Itsuka argued. Nah, we've got plenty of manliness as it is. Tetsu Tetsu said back. Er, no offense. I am not offended. Shizaki Ibarra said calmly. If it is the will of the heavens that our team grows, then so shall it be. I'm glad you feel that way, an unfamiliar voice said. Do you three mind if I join your team? Kendo turned and saw who had spoken. Who are you? The boy smirked. The name is Shinso Hitoshi, and I think I can be of service. Okay, anyone have any questions? Midoriya asked. He wasn't just confident in his plan. He was actually excited to see it happen. Still, he wanted to know if anyone found a flaw he'd overlooked. Do you think this will actually work? Yuraraka asked. She was nervous, but the idea of Midoriya's insane plan working was hilarious. I do, Midoriya said with a grin. As long as Hatsum sins, of babies work with your quirk. Hatsum looked up from the pair of high-tech boots she was adjusting. Oh, I guarantee they will. Well, maybe I can't give a 100% guarantee, but that's just because I don't want to get charged with false advertising. Asui just shrugged. We won't know for sure until we try, Ribbit, so let's do it. All right, competitors, present Mike shouted. It's time for the riders to mount their trusty steeds. Just remember, each rider will receive a number of headbands, each representing the points of one person on their team. You can wear them on your heads or around your necks, but nowhere else. A small robot trundled over to Midoriya's team and handed out the appropriate headbands. Midoriya gulped when he saw the big prize, the 10 million points, before he wrapped it around his head. That was covered by Asui's 130 points, Yuraraka's 115, and then Hatsum's 10. He figured that if someone actually did manage to get through their defenses and steal a headband, they were more likely to only get the outer three first. Once the headbands were secure on his head, he was lifted up onto the shoulders of Asui and Yuraraka. He noticed that the former winced, and he looked down in concern. He almost fell backwards, but Hatsum propped him up with one hand against his back. Sue, are you okay? I'm fine, Ribbit, Asui croaked. I have to match Ochako's height, and my body isn't meant to stand up straight for too long. Hopefully, you won't have to, Midoriya said. He looked at the team scattered around the stadium. Many of them were staring right back at him. We're going to have to do this quickly. Everyone ready? Yuraraka smiled up at him. Definitely. I can't wait for my babies to shine. Ribbit. Despite the tension, or maybe because of it, Midoriya laughed as he cycled through the Ultimatrix until he found the alien he needed. I'll take that as a yes, Tsu. And start. Without a second to lose, Midoriya slammed his hand down on the dial. When the green light faded, he had become a tall, yellow-skinned creature. He was muscular and had bat-like ears, 
but his most striking feature was his eyes. He had many over his bare torso and arms, but none on his face, some were as small as a human eye, while others were much larger. Each eye was green, with a black, slit pupil, and they all moved around independently. He wore black pants, but no shoes, and the Ultimatrix dial served as a belt buckle. Hi guys, surprise, folks, Midoriya has more than just one transformation up his now non-existent sleeve. If you wanted a wild card for today, here it is. Not even I know what he'll turn into next, and I'm one of his teachers. Let's get going. I guy shouted in his deep, guttural voice. One of the eyes on his shoulder noticed a student from 1B narrow his own eyes at him and start to lower a hand towards the ground. With barely a thought, the eye that noticed the boy glowed green and fired a bolt of energy that sent him tumbling into the rest of his team. Yeah, I don't want to know what he was trying. Uraraka, Hatsum, Nell. Everyone, give me a hand. Uraraka and Asui were struggling to lift Ai Guy's increased weight, but that changed when everyone gave Uraraka a high five, and they all became weightless. It's my turn. Hatsum grinned maniacally as she pressed a button on her backpack. Jet boosters, activate. Before the match had started, Hatsum had handed out a pair of boots to each of the other girls. They were supposed to let the wearer hover an inch or two off the ground, but Hatsum had done a last-second modification removing the safety limits and turning them into air-powered thrusters. Since the team was now weightless, all four of them rocketed into the air. Oh my goodness, present Mike shouted, barely heard over the excited screams of the audience. I can't say I was expecting that. What about you, Eraserhead? Team Midoriya has just turned into a living Zeppelin. I don't think anyone was expecting that. I guy couldn't help but laugh as his team flew over the stunned competitors. This is incredible. Uraraka, how are you doing? An eye on his elbow caught Uraraka looking a little pale. I'm going to have to cancel and reapply my quirk every few minutes, or I'm gonna get sick. Still, we should start phase 2 before someone figures out how to get to us. Got it. One of I guy's eyes winked at Asui. Time for Operation Air Raid. Here we go, Ribbit. Asui wrapped her tongue around his waist and pointed him at the ground. Bombs away. Still grinning, I guy rained down energy bolts onto the arena. He wasn't necessarily trying to hit anyone. Just make them decide that going after his team was more trouble than it was worth. From what he could see through the dust kicked up by his makeshift airstrike and he could see a lot even Bakugo's team had peeled off in search of easier prey. One of his eyes glanced at the timer on the big screen. Only 28 minutes to go. Back in the waiting room, the big three were in hysterics. Even Amajiki wiped away tears from laughing so hard. I can't believe it, Tagata said as he tried to get his breath back. That is the funniest thing I've ever seen. It's insane, Amajiki added. It's awesome, Hado pointed at Team Midoriya on the screen. Okay, we have to try something like that during our turn. Kagata grinned. Yeah, we can fly around, and Tamaki can use his tentacles to hit any other team that gets close. Then it's decided, Hado said as she pointed to the ceiling. We shall call it Operation Flying Spaghetti Monster. Amajiki rested his head on a desk. Damn it, Midoriya, why did you have to inspire them? Not cool, Todoroki. Kaminari shouted as the team in question left him and Gyro frozen up to their waists, and Shoji, who had been carrying them, up to his neck. Stop making ice puns, Gyro yelled. Todoroki didn't reply as he snatched the headbands from Kaminari, but Yeyarazu felt bad that Gyro had been knocked out of the competition. Sorry, Gyro-chan, she called out over her shoulder. We need to get to another team, Todoroki decided. Ida, we need to speed up. Understood. My sincerest apologies, Yamomo. Ida placed his hands firmly on Yeyorazu's waist. Takoyami-san, make sure we are all secure. Takoyami merely nodded, and Dark Shadow grabbed both his partner and Todoroki. Ready, the quirk said. Ida's boosters began to glow. Here we go. Recipro burst. Team Todoroki suffered collective whiplash as they rocketed towards another team Ajiro, Hagakure, Sato and Minta, with Hagakure wearing the headbands. Dark Shadow tilted Todoroki over so that his hand was almost touching the ground. Ice rushed out, encasing Sato and Ajiro's feet and stopping them in their tracks. Secret weapon, Ajiro shouted. Now, with a primal roar, Sato lifted Minta up and threw him straight at Yeyarazu, who went wide-eyed as the small boy flew at her. Come to daddy, Minta shouted. Acting on reflex, Yeyarazu created an oversized flyswatter and slapped Minta out of the air. The boy bounced off the ground once, and then lay still, knocked unconscious. As Team Todoroki blew past Team Hagakure, Dark Shadow neatly stole the headbands from Hagakure. Here you go, Dark Shadow said as he placed the headbands around Todoroki's neck. Good work, he said. Let's pull back until Eater recharges, and we'll do it again. Got him it. F F F. Dude, calm down. Siro shouted over the explosions and cursing. 
We've already got over 600 points. I don't care. Bakugo shouted back as Ciro reeled him in from another bombing run that netted the team two more headbands. It doesn't matter unless we take first place. Get over it. Ashido snapped back. What matters is how you finish, not how you start. Bakugo snarled, and then glanced up at the real target of his rage. I can't believe that moron Deku used the same plan as me. Can't that idiot come up with his own ideas? Ashido bit her lip so hard she drew blood from the scowl on Ciro's face. He was in the same boat as her. When Midoriya's team flew out of reach, Bakugo had taken his frustrations out on any other team they could reach. His rampage had netted them plenty of headbands, but the blitz attack was so fast that none of them were sure how many points they actually had. What also bothered most of Team Bakugo was the behavior of their leader. As skilled as Bakugo was, he was still an absolute asshole, and was even more ruthless than they'd seen before. More than one team they'd blitzed would have to see Recovery Girl when this round was over. At least Midoriya was doing well, she told herself. His plan was brilliant and hilarious, with Asui pointing him at clusters of brawling teams and scattering them with his laser eyes. If his team wore the appropriate costume, they could have starred in an old kaiju movie, with Midoriya as the head of the flying monster. She couldn't help but giggle at the thought. Bakugo glared back at her. What's so funny, raccoon eyes. And just like that, the humor was gone. Nothing. Let's go get some more points. Smartest thing you've said all day. Everyone, go right. Guys, I think I'm reaching my limit, Uraraka panted. I need a few minutes before we can do this again. I guys spotted the clock. We only have a few minutes left, anyway. Can you hold us up until the last 60 seconds? Uraraka was pale and sweating after using her quirk so many times, but she nodded. I think I can do that. Good timing. Hatsum chirped. The batteries in my babies are running low. As soon as we land, we'll have to do this the old-fashioned way. I guy nodded. Okay, let's start heading back to the ground. Uraraka, release your quirk when I give the signal. Suyu, can your tongue hold me steady without her quirk? I'm pretty sure, Ribbit. Asui glanced at the clock, at least for most of that last minute. If she can't, I'll just reapply my quirk on you for a few seconds, Uraraka said tiredly. Thanks. I guy took stock of the chaos below. More than one team had noticed that they were coming in for a landing. I'll keep everyone else at a distance as much as I can, but a few might slip past me. Hatsum san do you have anything to slow those teams down? I have a net launcher, Hatsum offered. Ooh, and I can try out my new stun discs. I just hope I calibrated the voltage correctly. I guy didn't like how that sounded. Just use those on someone really tough, like Kirishima. You got it, boss. We're close enough to the ground. Uraraka waited until Hatsum got a firm grip on her. Release. With gravity suddenly applying to them again, only Hatsum's thrusters kept them from crashing hard into the ground. As I guy suspected, several teams immediately changed course and headed straight at them. What's this? Team Midoriya is back on solid ground, and it looks like almost half the other teams are after them. Hiroraka must have reached the limits of her quirk. She's definitely improved, having to hold up her entire team for almost the whole event. Hey, Eraserhead, you know you just referenced the weight of three ladies, right? Shut up. Eraserhead's faux pas aside, we've got just under a minute left. Can Team Midoriya maintain their lead, or is another team destined for a dramatic upset? Don't look away, this is when things get crazy. It all comes down to this, All Might said, unable to stop his leg from bouncing nervously. How do you think the other teams will react? Gran Torino asked Nighteye. It depends on the disposition of the team in question. Nighteye brought a hand to his chin. If the team has a decent number of points, they may try to stay out of the fighting entirely or go after more teams with small amounts of points. The ones that go after Team Midoriya will either be desperate, or supremely confident in their abilities like that one. All Might followed Night Eye's gaze and sighed. Oh, it's definitely the second option with that boy. Deku. I guy spotted Bakugo's team hurtling towards him long before his former bully shouted, but it didn't stop him from tensing up. He felt bad that Ashido and Siro were on Bakugo's team he could imagine the headache their leader was giving them. He also felt bad for what he was about to do. Sorry, guys. Team, swing left so that we're facing Bakugo. As soon as that was done, the eyes on his chest merged together into one very large eye that glowed green. A massive blast of energy fired out, hitting Kirishima directly in the chest. The force of the hit was so great that it sent the whole team skidding back, and if Siro hadn't caught Bakugo with his tape at the last second, he would have hit the ground and been disqualified. Thankfully, there were still enough eyes elsewhere on his body for Aigai to see Todoroki's attack coming. He fired smaller bolts at the ice that crept towards them, but it wasn't enough, Todoroki just sent even more ice and managed to catch Hatsum's feet. 
We're stuck. She cried out. And they're about to hit us. Dark shadow loomed overhead. Yeyarazu had created a large billhook. And Todoroki's arm was outstretched. All three were inches away from my guy. When the bell sounded. It's over. Present Mike shouted. All teams, cut your quirks and cool your jets. The second round is done. Ida had been in the middle of another recipro burst and hadn't been able to cut it in time. Startled as they were by the bell, the two teams collided and fell to the ground in a tangle of limbs. Oh, Midoriya groaned as he turned back to normal. Whoever that is, can they get their elbow out of my face? Sorry, Deku-kun, Yuraraka said as she wiggled free. Wait, did we win? Did we keep the 10 million points? With trembling hands, Midoriya took the headbands off to double check. Sure enough, all four headbands were secure. In first place, with 10 million, 255 points, we have Team Midoriya. They had an absolutely brilliant defense that nobody saw coming. Way to go, kids. We did it, Deku-kun. Hiroraka dove on top of Midoriya and hugged him. We won the second event. Overwhelmed by emotion, Midoriya hugged her back and then pulled Asui and Hatsum into the embrace. Congratulations, all of you, Yeyorazu said as everyone got back to their feet. Yuraraka beamed. Thanks, Yamomo. Why ya? Yeah. Th thanks, Midoriya said, trying and failing to stop the tears from running down his face. I can't believe it worked. Are you alright, Suyu? Ida asked. You keep rubbing your tongue. Asui grimaced. When we all fell, I got dirt all over it, ribbit. Do I owe you mouthwash now? Asui blinked. Ida had just told a joke. Just some water is fine, ribbit. In second place, with 1,210 points, it's Team Todoroki I. They played smart and went after the teams that were unbalanced by Midoriya's bombing run. Nice job. Todoroki nodded, but didn't show any other emotions, as far as he was concerned. Nothing mattered until he fought Midoriya in the final event. Takoyami was also stoic, but Dark Shadow looked as smug as a sentient mass of shadows could, even accepting a fist bump from Yuraraka. Ida and Yeyorazu, on the other hand, were very happy and accepted hugs and high fives from their friends. And in third place, with 1000 points even, we have Team Bekugo. They were utterly ruthless back there and totally destroyed anyone who got in their way. Midoriya waved excitedly as Ashido, Siro and Kirishima jogged up to the others. Way to go, guys. We made it into the final event. Heck yeah, we did. Ashido grinned. Just watch out for me, or you're gonna get it. And in fourth place, with 945 points, we have Team Shizaki. They managed to snag any points not being targeted by the other three leaders, and it paid off for them. These are our 16 finalists, folks. Let's give them, and all of our competitors, a big hand. The audience had already been cheering as the event came to a close, but it became deafening at present Mike's urging. With our top 16 chosen, let's take an hour for lunch and give our brave competitors time to rest. Come on, eraser head, let's get something to eat. You do that, I'm taking a nap. As the students began filing out of the arena, Midoriya felt a hand on his shoulder. He turned to see Todoroki staring at him with unnerving intensity. We need to talk. Hey, freshmen. The rising stars all jumped when Tagata appeared behind them, along with Hado and Amajiki. How are you doing? Oh, Mirio. Ida bowed. We are all quite pleased with ourselves. Eleven of Class 1 will be advancing to the final round. Yeah, we saw it online. Tagata waved his phone for emphasis. You all did amazing. We might be the big three, but we still haven't made it to the last round of a sports festival yet. Hey, uh, not to be rude, but aren't you three in the third year event? Ashido didn't mind seeing the big three, but she was still confused. Why are you here so early? Amajiki shrugged. To everyone's amusement, he still couldn't look her in the eye after she flirted with him. It's quiet in the waiting room, and we wanted to watch the footage of you guys. We're not allowed to actually be in the stands until our event, so this was the best we could do. Hado hopped from one foot to the other. Hey, where'd Midoriya Kun go? I figured he'd be with his best friends. UAS Rising Stars looked around. Sure enough, Midoriya had somehow vanished without their notice. Maybe he went to the bathroom or something. Siro wondered. If we don't run into him after getting some food, we should look for him. Good idea, Tagata said, clapping Siro on the shoulder. Hey, why don't we show you a secret? It's more of an upperclassman thing. But there's actually a small vendor that exclusively serves students, so you won't have to wait in line. Best of all, it's free for competitors. Yuraraka immediately latched onto the word free. Okay, let's go. We should get some extra food for Deku-kun, just in case. Asui frowned. Still, I hope everything is okay, Ribbit. Midoriya was nervous more than usual, anyway, to the point that Ben stood next to him to offer silent support. On the opposite side of the hallway, Todoroki locked his intense gaze with Midoriya's own. What did you want to talk about? Midoriya asked. Todoroki finally closed his eyes. 
He looked like he was trying to find the right words. I'm only telling you this because, out of everyone in our class, I respect you the most. As such, I feel like you deserve to know why I want to challenge you so badly. I would appreciate it if you didn't tell anyone what I'm about to tell you. Okay, this is weird, Ben said, mirroring Todoroki's crossed arms in posture. He doesn't need to tell you anything. If I had money, I'd bet it all that he's using this as an excuse to get something off his chest. I won't say a word, Midoriya promised, while silently agreeing with Ben. Todoroki held up his right hand and let wisps of cold air flow around it. You've noticed that I only use the power of my right side my eyes. I never use my left side in battle. Midoriya nodded. It's because of my father. Todoroki's hand tightened into a fist. He's Endeavor, the number two hero. Midoriya's eyes went wide. Wait, really? I mean, I knew his last name was Todoroki as well. But there's nothing about him having children he stopped when Todoroki's own eyes narrowed. Sorry, go on. Have you ever heard of quirk marriages? Just the use of the term made Midoriya flinch. I H have, yes. It was never given much approval. And people who have powerful quirks who get married have to be evaluated to see if they aren't basically conducting a eugenics experiment. Oh my god. Todoroki nodded. Yes, my father used his influence to get people to look the other way. He basically bought my mother for her quirk. He was never able to surpass All Might himself, so he decided to have a child who could do it for him. It took him four tries to get it right. My mother couldn't handle it. After a while, she snapped and poured boiling water on the left side of my face because it reminded her of him. She was locked up after that. Everything I suffered more importantly. Everything she suffered is all because of Endeavor. So I decided that I would surpass him, All Might, and every other hero out there with just my mother's power. Endeavor can watch as I become the greatest hero without using his quirk. By this point, Todoroki had begun to pace and his voice was starting to crack. But he reined it in. I just want you to know where I'm coming from. You may have won the first two events, but those don't matter. When you and I fight in the next event, I'm going to crush you. So go ahead, turn into anything you've got, even the one that beat Namu. I'm going to prove that I don't need Endeavor. His peace said, Todoroki walked off. Midoriya stood there in silence as he tried to digest everything he had learned. That boy needs therapy, Ben commented. And I'm pretty sure Endeavor is breaking laws, but nobody can prove it. So, what do I do? Midoriya asked. You told me you didn't want advice, Ben reminded him. This is different, Midoriya argued. This goes way beyond a competition. You're right, Ben shrugged. What do you want to do? I want to help him, Midoriya said immediately. Good answer, Ben smiled. I don't know for sure, but the first step to helping him might be to force him to use his fire. Of course, if you do that, you might be making things harder for yourself. That doesn't matter, Midoriya said firmly. I want to be a hero. Heroes help people, that's all there is to it. Ben's smile turned to a full-blown grin. All right, buddy, put some thought into that. For now, though, you should get some food and find out who you're going up against first. Midoriya nodded. He could worry about classmates with deep-seated issues after getting something to eat. Deku-kun, there you are. Iraraka waved him over and handed him a plate of food. You missed the big three earlier, they showed us where to get all this. Oh, okay. Thanks. Midoriya's friends all frowned at the subdued tone in his voice. He ate almost reluctantly, like eating was the last thing on his mind. You all right, Midori? Ashido asked. Not really, Midoriya said. I was talking to Todoroki-san. It was personal for him, and he asked me to keep it to myself. His friends all nodded, but none of them liked it. Finally, after finishing his food, Midoriya took a deep breath, and his eyes hardened with resolve. Well, I can't worry about it now, he said. And I can't do anything about it until later. Have they posted the matchups yet? Asui shook her head. They should be up soon, Ribbit. As if on cue, the big screen brought up the list of who was fighting who, followed by brackets that showed the first round. Todoroki Shoto vs. Kendo Itsuka. Asui Tsuyu vs. Shinso Hitoshi. Hiroshima Ijiro vs. Tetsu 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 Tetsu. Bakugo Katsuki vs. Siro Hanta. Midoriya Izuku vs. Shizaki Ibarra. Ida Tenya vs. Hatsume Mei. Yuraka Achako vs. Takoyami Fumikage. Ashido Mina vs. Yeyurazu Momo. As the names were arranged into the brackets, Midoriya swallowed nervously. If he won against Shizaki who hadn't shown off her quirk much during the last event, save for using her vine-like hair to steal some headbands he was up against either Asui or Shinso, whom he knew nothing about. After that, he would be up against Takoyami or Yuraraka or Kendo or Todoroki. Well, that kinda sucks, Ashido said morosely. I really didn't want to go up against one of you guys in my first fight. She then flopped dramatically over Yeyurazu's lap. 
Don't hate me if I win, yeah Momo. Yayurazu pretended to think about it. Well, just this once. And I'm up against Takoyami-san, Yuraraka said nervously. Oh, this is gonna be hard. You think that's hard? Siro kept up his smile, but everyone could see the sweat on his brow. I'm up against Bekugo. Any ideas, Midoriya? A few, Midoriya muttered. Keep him from pointing his hands directly at you. Also, he usually leads with his right. Good to know. Siro gently elbowed him. Thanks. Okay, folks. Present Mike's voice brought them all to the present. I hope you got enough to eat, and I hope you went to the bathroom with all the excitement coming up. You might not be able to hold it in. That's disgusting, Aizawa said. The first match is starting in two minutes. Shinso Hitoshi and Asui Tsuyu, get down here. Everyone else who isn't about to start a match, go to your assigned sections with your classes. Moving on, we should probably remind everyone of the rules. The fight ends when one competitor is unable to fight, surrenders, or is forced out of bounds. Also, the lovely Midnight and our good friend Cementos will be acting as referee, in case things get out of hand. Just don't do too much damage to each other, or Recovery Girl will let you have it. I guess this is it, Ribbit. Asui got up and smiled at her friends. See you guys later. Do your best, Su chan Iroraka called after her. The six of them joined the rest of 1A, just as Asui entered the arena. On the other side was her opponent the purple-haired boy who had called out their class. From the hero courses class 1A. She may look cute, but her entire body is a frog-shaped weapon. It's Asui Tsuyu. And from general studies, it's the dark horse who managed to make it to the final event. It's Shinso Hitoshi. In the arena, Shinso nodded at Asui, who bowed slightly. Midnight raised her whip high. Are both fighters ready? Yes. Ribbit. Yes. Midnight brought the whip down. Begin. So alright folks that's all for today. Stay tuned for part 4. Do subscribe, like and share for more such videos. Also check out the story and author The Incredible Muffin on fanfiction.net. Press the bell icon to be notified first on release. See you in the next video till then goodbye.